Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com I need some money. Yeah, everybody needs money. I need some we're going to talk now about an economic trend that is getting some attention, the wage gap between white Americans and black Americans. It's worse today than it's been in almost 40 years. In 1979, black men were paid 22 percent less than white men for doing the same job. In 2015, the disparity between pay rates for black and white men climbed to 31 percent. That's according to a new study from the Economic Policy Institute. That's a research institution. It leans left. The study's most surprising surprising finding, though, might be that the gaps get even wider when workers have more education. To hear more, we invited one of the authors of the study, Valerie Wilson, to the studio to give us some details. We were also joined by Adia Harvey Wingfield. She's a professor of sociology at Washington University in St. Louis. She studies the ways race, gender, and class affect the working world. And I started our conversation by asking Valerie Wilson why these gaps have been growing. A big part of what we did in this study was to try to pin down all of the factors that would reasonably affect what workers get paid. We controlled for level of education. We looked at years of experience, what region of the country you live in, whether or not you live in an urban area or a rural area. And even after controlling for those factors, there was a sizable difference between what black and white workers were paid. When we look at how this gap has changed over time, most of the change in that gap hasn't been the result of those observable factors, education, experience, et cetera. Most of it is that part of the gap that remains, quote unquote, unexplained or the part that we identify as discrimination. One of the things, again, that leapt out to a lot of people looking at this is that many people, including the president, have continued to press, you know, education, education, education. That is the bulwark against discrimination or it's the antidote to discrimination. And one of the, I think, truly disturbing findings is that that is not the case, that even when all things are equal, that they turn out not to be, at least in terms of the salaries. What, what's your take on this? I think there's an important distinction to be made when we talk about the role of education in the labor market. Unquestionably, people with higher education, more you know, years of schooling, earn higher wages. So education is effective in terms of economic mobility. Education is not, however, the answer to racial inequality. Let's hear from Professor Idea Harvey Wingfield. First of all, I have to ask you, as a, as a person who works with data, Tell me some of the things that jumped out to you. Well, I wasn't surprised by the wage gap in particular because I think that's pretty consistent with what we would expect to find from the, the research. But in looking at what I know from the sociological literature, I think that that fills in some gaps as to why we see this happening. For example, my colleague Vinny Rossino at Ohio State University has done a lot of work that documents the ways in which discrimination is present for workers of color, particularly black workers. He finds that they're often subjected to different rules than their white counterparts are, that they're held to different standards that rules that may be applied to them are not necessarily applied to other coworkers. My other colleague, Lauren Rivera, has done an excellent study that focuses on the hiring processes for workers in elite professional services firms. And what she finds are that these social patterns where people tend to want to hire people who are like them matter in terms of who has access to these jobs in the first place. One of the findings is that black workers are offered lower starting salaries right out of college. Why might that be? Well, I think, again, that some of the issues that come out from sociological research play a role in this, that when 
black Americans, generally speaking, are largely stereotyped to be less intelligent, less capable, less focused. It's not surprising that that might translate into the perceptions that managers have in terms of offering starting salaries, particularly if the perception is that workers who are white workers are seen to be more suitable for the culture of a particular firm or the culture and the unspoken norms of a particular environment. I think that these types of stereotypes and perceptions exist in the broader society and that hiring managers aren't exempt from being influenced by them. I have to ask the question that there will be those who will listen to this and say, if these workers, white workers are getting paid more, then they must be more qualified. No, <laughs> that's not the case. No, and, and her data show that that's not yeah. the case. And the bulk of sociological research makes the point to show that that's not the case, that we aren't looking at a disparity in terms of qualifications right. or education or experience. When those things are controlled for, then if there's still a disparity, then that disparity can be attributed to discrimination. And the research shows that those discriminatory processes are in place. Before we let you go, we're running out of time. I wanted to ask if people agree that this is not acceptable, that people who are equally qualified should be equally desired and should be equally compensated, and that is not the case, what should they do? So the other sort of big finding from this report is that this widening of the racial wage gap has happened in a time we've seen overall growing wage inequality. So there are really two approaches here. One is to address that broader issue of wage stagnation that we see affecting black and white workers alike. But then on the specific, race-specific side of things, we really have to begin to sort of pull back the covers because a lot of this happens because workers don't know what other people in their job are making. A lot of that has to do with which employers are required to report on what they pay workers by race, ethnicity, and gender, as well as the fact that, you know, we've gone through different administrations over time when there's been less emphasis and enforcement of existing anti-discrimination law. So I think that we have to combine both the broad economic policies that are going to boost wages for all workers, middle class workers in particular, but then also those very race specific solutions as well. Valerie Wilson is the director of the Economic Policy Institute's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, and she's one of the authors of a new report on black-white wage gaps. Adia Harvey-Wingfield is a professor of sociology at Washington University in St. Louis. Valerie Wilson was here in Washington. Adia Harvey-Wingfield was in St. Louis. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank Thank you. you. So an architect is saying that a bank wouldn't cash her check because they were being racist. She posted something on Facebook, and this post has gone a little bit viral. Let's take a look at this Facebook Facebook post. Uh, so here you say when you deposit your paycheck at 9 a.m., when you get into your car. So she's sort of walking us through exactly what happens. But to even delve a little bit deeper into what happens, she says that the bank manager had her sit in his office while he Googled her architecture company, Nelson Incorporated, to see if it was real and then called the HR department to verify whether she was really employed there. Um, now, the bank has issued a statement. They say, generally speaking and in compliance with uh, applicable law, We advise clients who are new to KeyBank that we may place holds for a short period of time on their deposits during the first 30 days after they open their accounts with us. Um, Now, the person who wrote the post says she opened the account on September 5th, meaning that her account had been open for 31 days and should not have been subject to the hold. And even though she provided an ID and had a paycheck with the design firm's logo and gamely answered questions about her work, the bank employee still felt the need to verify with a third party rather than believe her. And she again said in this Facebook post that it was absolutely racial bias. And I'm wondering, given what you guys know about this story, would you agree? Do you think this was racial bias or just the bank being cautious? So if if I was a conservative, I'd say, well, that's never happened to me. So that means that she's lying. Now, if you think about it for a second, the other way to think about it is, hey, wait, that's never happened to me. I wonder why it's never happened to me, but it happened to her. Right. And so then when you think about it that way, like, wow, that... Why do they not believe her? Why do they not trust her? Why they have, have they trusted me every time? And then be like, whoa, 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 I don't know if I want to take your money. I don't know if I want to deposit your check. Yeah. I never got that question. And an interesting part of the story is, too, so she deposited the check, and then about 15 minutes later, she got a call from the bank manager saying, could you come back in? And then they did this verification process of calling HR. And I thought that was particularly fishy, that she was called back in, and they had an an extra sort of check and balance system that it didn't seem other customers were experiencing. Don't you think that was strange, Brett? I think that is super weird. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily racist. It might also be sexist. (laughs) <laughs> so I want to give them the benefit of the doubt of being either racist or sexist, maybe the benefit of being both. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think it's, it's ridiculous to do something like this. I feel like there are 
checks and balances in place that you as a bank can utilize in any situation to make sure that, you know, there's no identity theft or fraud here. But I don't think any of them should involve, like, come back into the bank sit down here and let me ask you questions about how to build a building. And then especially after you answer them correctly, continue to hold a, hold your money for, for yeah. ransom, essentially. Yeah, and another question this raised for me was uh, sort of, so she posted this on Facebook and it went viral. Do you think that that is, is, are we seeing this more often? We see this a lot. We talk about it on the show where something, something wrong happens to someone and they post about it on Facebook, um, sort of reaching out to their friends and family saying, I, I experienced this injustice, I don't know what to do, and then it gets picked up. Is this the correct way, would you say, to deal with issues like this? Because they obviously do get picked up. Yeah, in this case, I say definitely yes. So there's more borderline cases where somebody's harassing you and then, or trying to uh, pick up on you or something, and then you post it to their family mm-hmm. or you post it to their employer and they get in a world of trouble. Uh, that's un- uncomfortable. And then we're going to really get into each other's lives. And I don't love that. Um, but in a situation like this, well, she's just saying, hey, What's going on here? This, right. this, this doesn't seem right. And she's sharing it with her friends. Like you would share if something crazy happened to you. You got in an accident. You got this happened, that happened. And then if it turns out a lot of people are pissed about it or they have similar experiences, good, then we learned something from it. I don't even think that's a close question. Yeah, I th- and then the other argument is she's lying. Like someone could say she's lying. Maybe, if not this case, other people make up something terrible about someone, go on social media, ruin someone's life who didn't necessarily do anything. But there are legal um, you know, steps you can take if someone lied about you. I don't think, reading this, she's not really mentioning any particular names. She's not going after anyone individually. She's more saying, the process I went through at this place of business, where, who should be responsible for how their employees treat new clients like myself, I need to call them out. And social media, I think this is the right way to use it. This is not going overboard on someone who kind of made a mistake. This seems like perfectly proportional to what happened to this individual to make sure to raise awareness about this kind of behavior. And what do you think about the bank's reaction? Because right now it just seems like they've issued a statement and they're uh, looking into the incident. Do you think this is sufficient or would you look for them to do more in the future? Well, so look, here's the thing. So... It's not like she's a, a customer of theirs for years and years and they're right, being an extra jerk to her, right? So do we know for 100% that it's uh, racism? No, but th- I think that it's more nuanced than that. I think the guy who did it doesn't know it's racism, yeah. right? So, and, and it, But that doesn't mean it's not. Like Maybe if it's a, a white male 55-year-old guy who comes in saying he's an architect... And it's 31 days since he's had the account and he gives a check. That guy doesn't even think twice. He just deposits yeah. the check and we're done with it. And, but when it's an African-American woman, he's like, mm, let me triple check this. Yeah. He doesn't think in his mind, I hate black people. <laughs> no, right. I mean, I mean, I'd be really surprised. <laughs> he does, I, I don't even think he thinks consciously in his mind, I distrust black people. I think he just had this moment of, okay, this something doesn't compute for me. I'm going to double check this. Right. And you see, that's the implicit bias that we're talking about. It doesn't make the person evil, although it is deeply frustrating frustrating to the person who has to deal with that. What we're trying to do, and what she did by putting it up on Facebook, is put a spotlight on it. Let's all think about it. And maybe if we're lucky, a couple of years from now, that, that guy who did that goes, hmm, that is weird. But if we're super lucky, maybe in a couple of days, he goes, hey, come to think of it, I, I, I didn't double check when it was the 55-year-old white guy. I haven't double checked a guy like that in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe a couple of years. Hey, maybe I learned something. I, it's, I, I know that I'm being wildly unrealistic. <laughs> and, well, and, I think kind but, of an interesting follow-up to that scenario that we don't often see in stories like this. And, and I also think of stories that we've reported on when uh, someone has experienced uh, homophobic behavior at a restaurant or something like that, and then they're called out on social media. Um, I wonder, you know, years after the fact, if these people do reflect, the people that have been called out do reflect on these experiences and think, oh, you know what, I did learn from this. I was in the wrong. It sucked being called out. Um, and it really, it was really uncomfortable for me. But I'm glad that I learned, you know, what the error of my ways was. That I, that I was uh, sort of had been programmed to be racist subconsciously or whatnot. It's, it's not that much to ask for. I know what the natural reaction is likely to be, which is, what are you talking about? I'm not racist. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I know because you. I'm sure that you think that you're not right. 
And we're not saying you're the boogeyman, that you're evil. What we're asking you to do, and, and, and I think I am being realistic in saying that we can do this not necessarily with any specific person, but at large. Where And, and to finally to come back around in, in answering your question, Grace, of what would you do if you're the bank, if I'm running the bank, I sit everybody down and I go, hey guys, let's take a look and see if we're asking black people more than we're asking white people to double check where their check's coming from. And are, is it proportional? Does it make sense? Are we doing this right? We're not saying we're bad guys. We're just saying, hey, let's use Brett's rule here. Are we being shitty? Are we being uh, accidentally shitty to right. people? Not right. On purpose. And yeah, and it's not like we all wear our hoods at night and decided we hate, we're going to do this to black people. It's that maybe some folks are right that that we all have a little bit of implicit bias, right? Yeah. And and so let's look into it and see if we can fix it. Niggas. Niggas. My players getting called the N word in the game. And they just said, We're not serving you, Willing Hills people. This is for the Bethel fans. New at five, a youth football coach says his players got a hostile and hateful response in Bethel Park. Some of his players kneeled in protest during the national anthem, and that's what set it off. Channel 11's Courtney Brennan spoke to him about what took place after that. Courtney? Peggy, so uh, emotions and tensions were running so high at this midget football game over the weekend that Channel 11 has learned that police were actually called here to this field to keep the peace. I never witnessed anything like that. Head coach Marcus Berkeley tells Channel 11 he was so upset that he took to Facebook this weekend after his Woodland Hills team played Bethel Park on Saturday night. It seemed like everything started uh, once the national anthem started being played. Uh, two or three of my players uh, took a knee. Once they took the knee, you see cameras and you know people flashing, you know, taking pictures of the, you know what's going on. And, and out, of, out of nowhere, you just hear if the little N word want to take a knee, they shouldn't be able to play. Berkeley says that initial comment came from the stands, and he says his 12 and 13 year old players then heard it on the field. Players told me, say, Coach, you know, they calling us the N-word. Tensions escalated from there. At one point, Berkeley told us his parents tried to get food at the concession stand and were turned away. They said, we're not serving you Woodland Hills people. This is for the Bethel fans. It's our senior day and stuff like that. So with all that going on, it seemed like it was another attack. Woodland Hills won the game, but not before police were called to stand guard on the field and keep the peace. It was a sad night, but... You know, we was glad to get out of there. Berkeley's team has played in the Parkway Youth Football League for two years. He says never in that time or during his years as a player has he seen such hatred. Those three or four bad apples or how many other people was, was actually saying that stuff doesn't represent the town of Bethel Park. But it was just, it was just, just it was, it was bad, man. And I did speak with the president of the Bethel Park Junior Football League last night and just got a statement from him a short time ago. He says uh, the league has scheduled a meeting to discuss this. And he said that the Bethel Park League, they are doing their due diligence by interviewing the parents of the team, spectators, and the players. Uh, and as he told me last night, he says that Bethel Park takes this matter very seriously and does not condone this type of behavior. Reporting live this evening in Bethel Park, I'm Courtney Brennan for Channel 11 News. More details now. This picture caused an uproar in Coriopolis last week. A group of Cornell High School cheerleaders took a knee before a football game while a group of veterans was presenting the colors. The cheerleaders got threatened on social media. They say they never intended to offend anyone. So how's the college responding to this incident? We're having a, um, a race forum. And what's that? A forum on race so we can discuss the incident and the surrounding issues of race. So the usual lip service? Uh, no comment. All white people are inherently racist if they want to believe it or not. As Neil Pickett goes about his sophomore year at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I'm planning to have people check their privilege. He's creating a stir with these racially charged sweatshirts and shirts. The people have been talking about race, sexuality, and gender, but now I'm doing it to make them uncomfortable. Last month, he debuted the sweatshirts on Etsy, which soon drew attention on social media. Shirts like this. It's just not right. Local leader in the African-American community, Michael Johnson, says Anil is going about this the wrong way. Are there racist people? Yes. 
Are all white people racist? Absolutely not. There's another hoodie that reads, if I encounter another cop with a God complex, I'm going to have to show the world that they are human. One message I really did with that was, if there's no justice, there's no peace. Um, it's people that look like me that's dying every day in the street. Despite that we all have our freedom of speech, I think this kind of tone and rhetoric uh, divides us. Even though Anil has received death threats, he intends on still selling the sweatshirts to keep creating the conversations on race. People have been having these conversations, but they've been sitting around whiteness or sitting around other people's feelings, and that's not what I'm trying to do. Now let me just say, we have extraordinary appreciation and respect for the vast majority of police officers who put their lives on the line to protect us every single day. They've got a dangerous job. It is a tough job. After weeks of calls for him to resign, Good Howard morning. County has reached a separation agreement with Sheriff James Fitzgerald, whose like time as sheriff will come to an end Saturday. He will be retiring officially. But Council Chair Calvin Ball made the announcement Tuesday. Legally, the county could not fire Fitzgerald since he's elected. Most available option of impeachment would just take too long. Pressure had been building after an investigation by Howard County's Office of Human Rights. Employees describe Fitzgerald fostering a culture of bullying, discrimination, and harassment, making racist and sexist remarks, including using the N-word. I have not talked to the sheriff. I have not heard that he's apologized. Um, all I can say is there was so much pressure. County Executive uh, Alan Kittleman credits Lieutenant Charles Even Gable, who first came forward with the allegations. It was his courage that has helped us to bring this forward and bring the sheriff's uh, time in office to an end. Governor Larry Hogan will now appoint a new sheriff to fill the remainder of Fitzgerald's term through 2018. We need to make sure that we stand up for people who are going to respect women, respect uh, anybody from any race or any ethnic group or any religious group. I've seen what's around the corner. I've seen what's over the horizon. And I promise you, you niggas have nothing to celebrate. I know I won't get there with you. I'm going to Canada. You know, last week on the show, I talked briefly about a story that I witnessed walking down the street. A story about a young black guy who I saw walking on the street and he was stopped by police. He had his hands up in the air. And I was upset because the police seemed to be running this young person's name. And I saw them search him for reasons that I really could not understand. The video of this encounter that I'm talking about and the aftermath of it when I started asking the police questions is posted on Newstalk1010.com. Um, I talk about these kinds of stops all the time because I believe that they are a violation of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, we like to frame these issues as a debate and so apparently people think that you can debate what somebody's rights are. And so I always get people calling me and texting me and saying, Desmond, I don't believe you. I think you're wrong. Let the police do what the police need to do. Well, perhaps then you should, as they say, tell it to the judge. This is a story from late Thursday in the Toronto Sun by Michelle Mandel. Judge slams Toronto cops and acquits drug dealer. This is a story about a guy who spent five years in jail and had a retrial after he had served his five years in jail where the judge said that he was acquitted of all charges, acquitted for the charges that he had already served five years in jail for. Why? Because the judge said that the police were guilty of racial profiling and he suggests that they may even have planted the drugs that were found inside the man's Jaguar when they stopped him on August 21st, 2008. So, you know, when these stories come up, I know a lot of people try, like to feel like this is a one-off. This is just a weird circumstance and Desmond, you don't even really know what happened. I, I do know what happens in these cases and apparently this judge understands it as well. Now I want you to think about what happened to this man. This is a 28-year-old man who, yes, had been convicted on charges before. So the police were following him around. 
And the police decided one day that they wanted to stop this man, but they didn't really have a reason. They stopped him anyway. They, uh, he was going back to his car, uh, and they stopped him. One officer comes, a second officer comes. Before you know it, there are multiple officers there. And the judge says, you had no real reason to stop this guy. In fact, the judge said that the police provided different reasons as to why he was stopped. The man was chased. He was tackled. He was searched at least three times, two at the scene and one at 14 Division. His vehicle was searched with no warrant and no grounds to support a need to do so, the judge said. So... This is the problem that a lot of people have, and this is the situation of policing that we're in right now in Toronto, is that people think that, well, if the police knew that this guy may have been a criminal in the past, won't we want them to stop him? Shouldn't we want police to go after people like that, to look in on people like that, to follow them around, maybe search them every once in a while? And and when the police say, by the way, that they can't do carding anymore which is not true because they're still doing it every day. This is actually what they're talking about. They're saying that we are no longer allowed to stop somebody for no reason and search them. But of course, they've never been allowed to do that because it's against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So this man was hit with 17 charges, including possession of a loaded restricted firearm found hidden in his car and possession of cocaine and marijuana for the purposes of trafficking. Now, the judge put doubt about whether or not the drugs were actually the man's or if the police themselves had planted these drugs. That's a judge saying it. It's not me. But the man has already spent five years in jail. So whatever the judge has decided now, it doesn't get him back those five years. But I think it's really, really, really important for people to understand that you have a charter and that your charter rights actually don't go away because, for example, the police say, well, I got to check this guy out, but I'm scared. I got to check this guy out, but he may be carrying a weapon and I don't know what he's going to do. That was the excuse in the story that I reported last week was that somebody had called in a stabbing and the police, well, you know, they were just trying to make sure that they were safe and that they were all right. And so they decided that in case the guy who called in the stabbing himself, in case he was the person that had stabbed somebody, even though there was no evidence that anybody had been stabbed, well, maybe let's just search him. We want to be safe and we want to go home to our families. It doesn't work like that. The law says that you actually have to have a reason. And your reason has to relate to a specific crime that the person that you're searching is committing or is likely to be about to commit. Just because the police in any given situation say, man, I'm really scared of this guy and I don't know what he's going to do. That doesn't mean that the person's charter rights disappear. And so in the case of this man, who is now 28 years old and spent five years in jail, his name is Nosakare Ahenhen. He lost five years of his life because the police made up a story about him. And the judge thinks that the police might have even planted the things that were found in his car to give him a conviction. The thing that I find most remarkable about this, though, is that there's absolutely nothing that can be done in the aftermath about a story like this. Now that we know that a judge believes that police in our city were capable of stopping a guy for no reason, chasing him down to the ground, tackling him, searching him three times, including once at the police station and searching his car without a warrant. Now that we know that those dudes did that, we even know their names because they had to show up in court to answer for their actions. No action is going to be taken legally against them until, of course, this man sues them, which it sounds like he's about to do. He's going to file a civil lawsuit. So then the police will hire the best lawyers in the world. And they will try to defend their officers about why they did this. But they won't face criminal charges. They won't face criminal charges for violating his civil rights. They won't face criminal charges for the judge's conclusion that they planted drugs in the guy's car. 
They just get to go back to work as they've been doing every day since 2008 when this happened. There are ongoing consultations happening right now around things like the Special Investigations Unit, which investigates police, which doesn't happen in a case like this because this is not in the SIU's mandate. But there's also the Ontario Independent Review of Police Directorate, the OIPRD. And right now the government is taking suggestions about how to reform a body like that. Maybe you could start with getting rid of officers who violate people's rights and plant illegal drugs on them and take five years out of their lives. I don't know. Maybe you could start there, OIPRD. Maybe that might restore a little bit of the trust that people have lost in their police. 50 years, the BPP. When two young college students gather together in an office in Oakland, California, mid-October 1966, no one, not even themselves, knew what they could or would accomplish. The men, 24-year-old Huey P. Newton and 29-year-old Bobby G. Seale, would leave the office with something called the Ten Point Program, and through the organization they founded, the Black Panther Party, they would impact the nation and enter the annals of history. The party had global impacts and marked a generation with its paw print of black youth and class resistance. But as we know, that was 50 years ago, a lifetime ago. Who knew that any of us would still be alive today? Today, decades later, some of us are still dwelling in the system's prison cells, political prisoners in everything but name. Let us not forget our brothers and fellow warriors in chains among them. Sundiata Akoli, a comrade of freed political prisoner Asata Shakur and the late Zaid Malik Shakur, captured May 2nd, 1973. He is a prolific writer. Delbert Orr Africa, a member of the Chicago chapter, now a member of the MOVE organization and one of the MOVE nine members of MOVE imprisoned after a confrontation with cops in Philadelphia, August 8, 1978. Russell Maroon Schultz, a member of the Black Unity Council, an affiliate of the Philadelphia branch, also a brilliant writer, historian, and thinker. Imam Jamil Abdullah Alamin, formerly known as Rat Brown, was the former Minister of Justice of the Black Panther Party. He was an anti-drug activist in Atlanta, where he led as Imam of the local mosque. Joseph Jojo Bowen of the Philadelphia branch. Robert Seth Hayes of the New York chapter, presently facing serious health challenges, including diabetes and hepatitis C conditions. Fred Mohammed Burton, Philadelphia branch, now doing time at SCI Somerset. Dr. Mutulu Shakur, an acupuncturist by trade, who was convicted of helping Asada get free. He's also the loving stepfather of the late legendary rapper Tupac Shakur. Jaleel Montekin of the New York chapter, who with the late revolutionary leader Safia Bukhari co-founded the Jericho Movement in 1998 to help educate people on political prisoners and advocate for their freedom. These are some of the many people who have done decades in prison for political revolutionary activities during the 60s, 70s, and 1980s. Most have been members of the Black Panther Party or the Black Liberation Army and were freedom fighters for the black nation. Let us not forget them. Let us organize for their freedom and the freedom of us all. For more information, contact thejerichomovement.com. It's been 50 unbelievable years since Huey and Bobby typed out the 10-point program and platform of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. How many times in the last 50 years have you reread the 10-point program and marveled at how grim the conditions still facing millions of black people remain half a century and black life still don't matter let us join with our younger brothers and sisters and help build a freedom movement worthy of our fallen soldiers and 
our ancestors from imprisoned nation. This is your brother, Mumia Abu Jamal. We want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried by a jury of their peer group. Our people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. And just two weeks into oral arguments at the U.S. Supreme Court, already the justices are on their third case involving race and the criminal justice system. The case they're hearing today tests the constitutionality of widespread rules that bar courts from examining evidence of racial bias in jury deliberations. NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg reports. The federal rules of evidence, as well as rules in most states, generally bar courts from hearing juror testimony about deliberations after a trial is over. Indeed, just two years ago, the Supreme Court reiterated that to allow an inquiry into juror deliberations would threaten the integrity of the jury system by inhibiting juror discussions. In that 2014 decision, however, the court specifically said there may be some cases of juror bias so extreme that by definition, the right to a fair trial has been abridged. If and when such a case arises, the court said, it would decide whether an exception is warranted. That day has now come. Today, Stanford Law Professor Jeffrey Fisher is arguing for an exception to juror secrecy in order to probe whether racial bias affected a verdict. Racial bias is so uniquely poisonous that it requires every tool to uproot. Fisher represents Miguel Peña Rodriguez, a Colorado horse trainer who was arrested in 2007 after two teenage sisters identified him as the man who groped them in a darkened restroom at a horse barn. At trial, the prosecution's case rested on the victim's identification. The defense highlighted the short time the victims actually saw their attacker, the suggestibility of the way police brought the girls to see the suspect through the window of a police cruiser at the roadside where the suspect was detained, and the defense presented an alibi witness who testified that Peña Rodriguez was with him in another barn when the attack occurred. The alibi witness, like Peña Rodriguez, was Hispanic. The jurors initially deadlocked, unable to reach a verdict. The judge told them it was their duty to try again. After 12 hours of deliberation in all and much shouting that could be heard outside the jury room, the jury found the defendant guilty on the three misdemeanor counts but failed to reach agreement on the felony. The state subsequently dismissed the more serious charge. Peña Rodriguez was sentenced to two years probation and required to register as a sex offender. He continues to train horses at the same barn. On the day his trial ended, his lawyers followed the usual practice of remaining in the courthouse to speak with any willing jurors. Two jurors told them that during the deliberations, one of the other jurors, identified in court records as H.C., had repeatedly expressed a bias against the defendant and his alibi witness because they're Hispanic. With the trial judge's permission, the lawyers then obtained affidavits from the jurors in which they quoted H.C. as saying that, from his experience as an ex-policeman, he knew that the defendant was guilty because Mexican men believe they can do whatever they want with women, that where he used to patrol, nine out of ten Mexican men were guilty of being aggressive towards women and young girls. The affidavits also quoted H.C. as saying that the alibi witness was not credible because, among other things, he was, quote, and illegal. In fact, the witness testified at trial that he was a legal resident of the United States. After receiving the affidavits, the trial judge ruled that there could be no questioning of jurors to see if a new trial would be justified, because the state has a rule barring inquiry into whatever happens in the jury room. The Colorado Supreme Court, by a 4-3 to three vote, agreed. Peña Rodriguez appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, where today his lawyer will argue that in cases of alleged racial bias, if the trial judge can't question jurors about their deliberations, the defendant is deprived of his constitutional right to a trial by a fair and impartial jury. The state will argue that protecting the secrecy of jury deliberations ensures full and frank exchanges of views and protects public confidence in the jury system. 
Colorado has on its side both history and the practice in most other jurisdictions. But the defense notes that more and more states, from California to South Carolina, allow post-trial inquiry into racial bias on juries, and that the rule has existed in some states for decades without undermining the jury system. Nina Totenberg, NPR News, Washington. Well, Haiti is on the list of what's supposed to be. Haiti, the people call, who are called Haitians, predominantly are people who are classified as non-white, who they're not supposed to ever have anything under the system of white supremacy except punishment <laughs> yeah. for being arrogant enough under Tucson to think that you, with your military skills, can take us over or tell us what to do. So many a, a historian has said that the reason Haiti is in the shape that it's in now, and sort of like the head wagon people of the world, you might say, mm-hmm. everybody kind of looks on them with great pity. It's because the white supremacists made that decision. Mm-hmm. We're going to make examples of you. Don't you ever think that you can have military force against me, us white supremacists of the world? In Haiti, the death toll from Hurricane Matthew has topped 1,000. Haiti's interim president, Jocelyn Privert, is warning the country faces a possible famine from what he described as the apocalyptic destruction of Hurricane Matthew. Haiti is also battling a growing cholera outbreak. The storm hit a week ago, but many areas have still received no aid. Food and medicine have run out. Authorities are now digging mass graves for those killed by the Category 4 storm. United Nations officials say nearly one million people are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, with up to 80 percent of Haiti's food crops destroyed in some areas. Aid agencies estimate at least 60,000 people are staying in temporary shelters. One unidentified person told reporters the hurricane took everything, including her home. I don't have a home. All my things went with the water. I'm going to give birth this month. I have nothing. I have been here in the shelter since Monday. On Monday, the U.N. made an appeal for emergency life-saving funds to provide critical food, water and shelter to the hundreds of thousands of people suffering in southwestern Haiti. This is Rudolf Muller of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs speaking at a news conference. The government of Haiti and the humanitarian country's team, Flash Appeal, seeks to provide life-saving assistance and protection to 750,000 people out of 1.4 million people in need over the next three months. To do so, we urgently need to mobilize 119 million U.S. dollars. The United Nations says Hurricane Matthew has triggered the largest humanitarian crisis in Haiti since the 2010 earthquake that killed as many as 300,000 people. Survivors reported drinking well water contaminated by dead livestock. At least 13 people have died of cholera after floodwaters mixed with sewage. On Sunday, Haiti's ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, Pierre-André Dunbar, told reporters Haiti may also face famine. This is not a population which is now on its knees, but on the ground, in front of the atrocity of Hurricane Matthew. The city of Jeremy, which is an important one, this city has been systematically devastated and 80 percent of the houses were destroyed, without mentioning houses which were damaged or severely damaged. Crops were also destroyed, which means the country will face a severe famine as the southwestern peninsula is considered as the breadbasket of Haiti, so the needs are urgent. Meanwhile, Sunday's planned presidential election in Haiti was postponed indefinitely in the wake of Hurricane Matthew. For more, we're joined by Ninaj Raoul, executive director of Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees, also a board member of IFCO, Pastors for Peace. Ninaj, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you talk about the severity of what happened, the thousand people lost? Yeah. First of all, the, the area of Haiti that was hardest hit is the southwest and some parts of the northwest. And the fact that the bridge was, was destroyed, a uh, bridge that's in Chiguav, it cuts off access to the south southern part of Haiti, that southern peninsula, which was hardest hit. And this part of Haiti is mostly farmers that live off of their crop. Um, 
and working with, with livestock animals. And most people lost a good amount of um, the crop and the livestock. So this is all they had. This is all they had. And they're in very remote areas. You know, there are some areas where people were not even aware that the hurricane was coming because they don't have access to radio. We're talking about a thousand people dead, possibly much more. Yeah, it's hard to know how many people are dead because people weren't even able to access to even look for people. So these are just really rough estimates. And as we see, the, the toll keeps going higher. And Your higher husband is from that area and is just headed there this morning. He just left for Haiti this morning. He's on his way there down now. And he's from a town called Baco Noir, which is in a NIP, NIP um, area of Haiti. That's the top part of the um, southwestern peninsula. And, um, you know, folks that, that are in a town called Cadno that were visited directly after from folks that we know, you know, didn't, were not even aware that the hurricane was coming. So they weren't even prepared to do anything about it, to defend themselves. So you have the people who have died. You've had um, the water supply, the crops that are destroyed. What about the water? And then the possibility that the water is contaminated and a cholera outbreak. Well, first, um, some of these are coastal villages. So the sea, the salt water spills over and contaminates the soil, which makes it hard to, to farm again. And then you have overflowing latrines that are going to further contaminate the waters um, that go into drinking water and just regular water that everyone uses every day. So um, we already had a, a problem with cholera, and whenever we have these floods caused from disaster, it, it exasperates the problem and more people. We're starting to see deaths from cholera already, even in the early days following the earthquake. Hurricane the, um, Matthew hit the coastal town of Lake Kai especially hard. Conditions at a local hospital remain bleak after flooding and power outages made treating patients nearly impossible. This is one of the patients at Lake Kai's hospital. <laughs> I have been waiting here for 12 days. I was ready for an x-ray that they were supposed to do on Tuesday, but then the hurricane came. Subsistence fishermen are reportedly among the most vulnerable in Haiti after Hurricane Matthew tore through Haiti, destroying boats and equipment used for daily catches. This is fisherman Jethro Laurent. Look at the misery of one country, our country and the trees that were destroyed. Nothing remains. Our materials were lost in the sea. Others are under the ground. What are we going to do? So you spoke about cholera. Um, talk about the history of cholera in Haiti. Well, cholera, there, there has been a history of cholera in Haiti over the years, but in, in recent years, um, the epidemic was caused from the U.N. troops that had spilled some sewage, some, some latrines, into the rivers. And, and explain this. This is after the earthquake of 2010. This is 2010. after the earthquake, when you had all these peacekeepers, peacemakers. And these the were UN. Nepali peacekeepers who had come in exactly. for the U.N. Right. So just from carelessness and neglect, um, some of their latrines had leaked into the rivers, and that's where this latest cholera epidemic started. Uh, um, it's close to 10,000 people have died as a result, and every time there's a disaster, which Haiti has many, then the situation gets worse and the cholera outbreaks begin again, and we've seen that in the past week already. And so how do you prevent this outbreak once again? It's, it's hard to say, Amy, because there have been— um, massive um, vaccination programs coming in, but it's been proven that these, these vaccination programs, sometimes it's business-related, and, and, and the strain that they're treating is not the same strain that, that exists in Haiti. I know that the Cuban doctors, that are the Cuban brigade that are there from Haiti, have been, have been um, excellent in preventing a lot of death and recovering folks faster. You know, I remember going down to Haiti after the earthquake, and in the hospitals where the Cuban doctors were, this is where the care was best. People were afraid to tell Americans that it was Cuban doctors that were there, fearful that U.S. aid wouldn't then come in. Right. But now, right away after this latest disaster, Cuba sent 800 doctors right away. And you've seen that changing a bit, especially in, in Africa with the Ebola outbreak, because the Cuban doctors took the forefront of everything. And people were had to admit that they were there. Now, what about 
refugees and deportations. Explain the latest situation with Haitian refugees in this country being deported uh, back to Haiti. Um, wasn't it just recently announced last month that the Department of Homeland Security announcing it would fully resume deportation of undocumented Haitian immigrants? Right. That was September 22nd that they announced that any the new policy for Haitian refugees. Any Haitians that reach the borders of the U.S. without permission to enter will be automatically detained until they are deported. Now, this was in reaction to a surge of refugees that have been coming up, Haitian refugees coming from Brazil. These are Haitians that moved to Brazil that were welcomed there after the earthquake because they needed the labor force when they were preparing for the World Cup and later the Olympics. Now that Brazil has is experiencing this um, economic crisis, um, the Haitians are being pushed out, and they're heading north to try to come to the U.S. borders. They've been entering for, on them through Mexico. They crossed like 10 countries to get there. Um, off, a big part of it is by foot. Many people die on the way. And then they've been mostly entering through the Tijuana-San Diego border. We've been receiving refugees coming up to New York from this group since late May. There are about four to 5,000 um, refugees that came in at that border. Now, because of so many folks coming in, there are more on the way. There's at least 1,500 waiting outside of the um, border of San Diego. Then um, the Obama administration announced that they were going to stop taking them in and detaining them and deporting them. Hmm. I wanted to ask about aid going to Haiti. Um, the Red Cross notorious there. Um, uh, a lot of criticism, suggestions that it, quote, lost half a billion dollars there. ProPublica in 2015 wrote how the Red Cross raised half a billion dollars for Haiti and built six homes. Even as the group has publicly celebrated its work, insider accounts detail a string of failures. The New York Times, uh, the report is here. The details are ugly. It says the Red Cross claims it gave homes to over 130,000 Haitians, but it actually built only six. Well, this is not the first time that we've seen the Red Cross do this. Um, they do this all over. They raise money on disasters and don't use most of it for the disasters. This is probably the most, um, the worst situation because they made so much money from the um, Haiti earthquake in 2010. And again, we see they were the first ones um, collecting money, and they, they're all over. The, the, the mass media is recommending people to give to the Red Cross for, for um, aid in Haiti right now. So it's, it's sickening that they get away with doing this over. They're basically getting away with murder because they're making money on the backs of, of these disaster victims. So how can you assure that money actually gets to Haitians? I think there, it's important to um, support Haitians that are helping Haitians, especially on the ground in Haiti. There are many, many. We've, we've always, um, I know, uh, Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees, we've been, um, we've been going down for disasters since um, 2004. And the first thing we do is identify people in the affected areas and work directly with them. There are a lot of serious, great people that are um, on the ground in Haiti that are very organized especially in these remote villages where government does not reach. And they are, I, I work with refugees, and a lot of them are persecuted because of their organizing work that they do. And I hear the stories. As recent as last week, I had refugees that are applying for asylum that have come in and, and simply for trying to improve their area. So there are people, you know, we just ask that people work with Haitians that are supporting Haitians. In the wake of the um, hurricane, has the Department of Homeland Security said we'll stop deporting Haitian refugees? They haven't, and that's one of the things we're asking for. First, I want to say that when the Department of Homeland Security, just before the hurricane, announced that they are going to be detaining and deporting, the, they, the reason they gave was that Haiti is in a better place than it was from the earthquake, um, that it's starting to recover. Meanwhile, um, the State Department is warning Americans not to travel to Haiti because it's dangerous. So that's a that's a direct contrast right there. So no, they have not stopped the deportations. Um, they're detaining people. Haiti, prior to that, Haiti was only accepting 50 deportees, only had the capacity to accept 50 deportees per month. Meanwhile, 50 people per day are coming in just in the Tijuana-San um, Diego border. So... That means people are already being moved to other detentions um, throughout the country, and they're just going to be sitting there waiting to be deported. Uh, uh
after the earthquake, and still many people live in makeshift tents because of the earthquake from 2010. But being there in Port-au-Prince and seeing ceremonies with President Bill Clinton, who said and there are two critical issues in his life at that time. One was the marriage of his daughter, the imminent marriage of Chelsea, and the other is the reconstruction of Haiti. He was a major force in Haiti. What happened? So, first of all, we have to go back, when we look at Bill Clinton and his relationship in Haiti when he was president, one of the worst things that he's done that's still hurting Haiti now, especially in the wake of these disasters that keep happening to Haiti, is this policy where he took the excess rice from Arkansas, where he's from, and dumped it in Haiti and used our tax dollars to subsidize it. Up until this past recent year, there's legislation that keeps getting knocked off to reverse this policy, although he apologized for it. Let's go to that apology. Yes, in 2010, former President Clinton publicly apologized for forcing Haiti to drop tariffs on imported subsidized U.S. rice during his time in office. The policy wiped out Haitian rice farming, seriously damaging Haiti's ability to be self-sufficient. This is the president apologizing at a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time. He was the U.N. special envoy to Haiti. Since 1981, the United States has followed a policy until the last year or so we started rethinking it, that we rich countries that produce a lot of food should sell it to poor countries and relieve them of the burden of producing (coughs) their own food. So thank goodness they can leap directly into the industrial era. It has not worked. It's maybe been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that I was a party to. I am not pointing the finger at anybody. I did that. I have to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people because of what I did. Nobody else. A Black Lives Matter protester Mm. interrupted Hillary at a fundraiser and said, Hillary Clinton, can you apologize to black people for mass incarceration? You know... Of the thousand things I could complain about with Hillary Clinton, being a racist really doesn't rise to the top of it. I mean, it's... it's, And she's also used to getting the apologies. It sure is fun being purer than everybody else. But does this person realize that Donald Trump in South Carolina, 20% of the voters who voted for Donald Trump disagree with the Emancipation Proclamation? Right. And this is who you're going after? This is where we start the battle, you fucking idiots. African American voters are some of the most reliable Democrats. Polls suggest they overwhelmingly will choose Hillary Clinton for president. But this election has not been easy. For many black voters, it's been an emotional roller coaster, as NPR's Sam Sanders found out. I went to Atlanta with a simple request for a cross section of African Americans. Describe this campaign season in as few words as possible. Yeah, now I'm exhausted. I feel like I'm watching a reality TV show run amok. And in two words, the circus. Mayhem. What I imagine politics to have been like in the 60s, that's what it feels like right now. Stockholm Syndrome. We have, as a nation, allowed ourselves to be convinced that this election makes sense. That was Amber Scott, Kalina Bowler... Gerald Griggs, Michelle Gibson, and Stacey Abrams. And if voters like these are the barometer, this year has been hard for black America. Caught between Donald Trump, who many black people view as racist, and Hillary Clinton, who many black voters just aren't that excited about. On top of that, repeated stories of unarmed black people being shot by police. And President Barack Obama's historic time in office is coming to a close. I remember when he was elected. And I remember him when he took the oath of office. Kalina Bowler is a TV producer. She talked to me at a production lot in Atlanta. She was thinking back to Obama's first inauguration. I was working on another production uh, here in Atlanta, and I was the only black person in the entire pre-production crew. I talked with Bowler and her friend Brittany Bailey. She told us at work that inauguration day, she just felt really special. And when I walked in, it was almost like they rolled out the red carpet for Kalina. (laughs) They rolled it out. They said, oh, come sit. They let me sit in the front. I was right. And, and, you know, I have an afro right now. So I was like blocking people's view, you know. And I started crying. And next thing I know, a tissue box showed up. I mean, it was. felt like royalty. I did. It was weird. But I said, you know what? I was okay with it. I said, let me have this. But it's been emotional whiplash from 2009 to 2016. I oftentimes just want to go home 
get under my bed (laughs) and just stay there. And Brianna Butler, who is 18 and can vote for the first time this year, said this about the election. This is what I've been waiting on. So many people I talk to say this election has worn them out. Michelle Gibson says there's one big reason why this campaign season feels so rough. I think it all comes down to race. It used to be economics. It used to be, you know, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And um, now I think a lot of the values center around race. Richard Rose is the president of the Atlanta branch of the NAACP. He says America has been grappling with race from its beginning. America has never repudiated white supremacy. It is a lot. We have normalized. America has normalized white supremacy and racial oppression. Minnie Shannon is 73. And she says feelings that might have been hidden before are now out in the open. It's out in the open because we had the nerve to vote a black man in. And and they're doing all this because they really cannot stand a lots of them. A lots of white men, especially southern white men, cannot stand the idea that they have a black man in the White House with his black family. This is Black America's 2016, a feeling that who they are and what America's first black president symbolizes is under attack. I heard little expectation that America's racial climate will get better anytime soon, no matter who wins the election, in part for Venice Lundy, because no one person can do it all. One person cannot come and solve the racial issues, the economic issues that are going on in this country. I mean, we are expecting them to be God and not be human. It takes people, groups of people. And then also it takes decades and generations. As far as getting that work done, Kalina Bowler, the woman who felt like royalty on Obama's first inauguration, here's what she told me. And this is a quote. The climate is scary, but I'm not scared. Sam Sanders, American NPR FDNY News. workers are planning to file a $150 million discrimination lawsuit against the fire department. Several FDNY civil employees say they're suing to end institutional racism and wage inequality. We're also calling for Commissioner Daniel Nigro to resign. An administrative manager we spoke to says three of our white peers were paid up to $35,000 more than black employees. I'd like to see things change so that other employees that are coming after me who work hard and who like the city and who like the fire department and who like to do good work, be adequately compensated and recognized for the work that they do. I'm expected to perform my responsibilities with little or no expectation of promotion, supervisory opportunity, or increase in pay. Group also says it filed a complaint for the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in August. In 2014, the city reached a $98 million settlement for the Vulcan Society a black fraternal firefighter organization who said the entrance exam was discriminatory. In a statement, the FDNY says, we have not seen the EEOC filing yet and therefore cannot respond to it directly. It also says over the last three years, we've made unprecedented progress toward increasing and improving diversity. Tanya in East New York, you're on WNYC. Hi, Tanya. Hello, good morning. I'm appalled. What my problem is with this whole situation is he was 28. What if it was a child? Would it have been okay? What if it was a child? It was dark. It could have been a child. That's what everybody's missing about this situation. It just so happened it was a, a it, thank God, you know, I can't even say that. It was just happened that it was a 25-year-old. But what if it was a child? Then what? This gentleman should do some time. I'm upset with the DA, and I want to know what can we do as African Americans to protest against the DA even recommending this sentence? Because I want him out. He's not here to protect us. He's here to protect his reputation well, and the, I'm upset Tanya thank you very much and of course district attorney is an elected position uh, and he was elected in 2013 so he's going to be up again next year Ken Thompson right right, professor that's right and I want to push back against the caller a bit though because Ken Thompson managed to do something that um, Donovan could not in Staten Island so we watched a man be choked to that, death that's by the a DA officer. who did not uh prosecute in the Eric Garner case. Right, did not prosecute Officer Pantiello in the Eric Garner case. So we saw someone be choked to death uh, by a police officer, and then the district attorney in that location couldn't even secure an indictment against that police officer. In Manhattan, excuse me, in Brooklyn, we see a person who shot 
in a, in a, in a, a set of circumstances that, again, some would describe as accidental, but there is the problem with the officer pulling his gun out, having his finger on it in a residential building, and then not rendering any assistance to the person who he shot. So those are the basis for there being criminal liability. Ken Thompson managed to actually secure an indictment and then a conviction in that case when a, another case with a more egregious set of circumstances didn't result in either an indictment or a conviction. And so I think there is a benefit that has to be recognized to the work that Ken Thompson and his office did. As you've been hearing, Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson died yesterday after a battle with cancer. He was just 50 years old. Thompson was Brooklyn's first black district attorney. He took office after a hard-fought election with Charles Hines, who had held the office for 23 years. In his less than three years as Brooklyn's chief prosecutor, Thompson stopped charging low-level, nonviolent drug cases, and he established a conviction review unit to investigate possible wrongful convictions. Alan Foyer has profiled Thompson for The New York Times, and he joins us now. Hello, Alan. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm all right. I want to talk about Ken Thompson's path to the district attorney's office because it was not at all typical. Of course, he did work on the Abner Louima case way back in the 1990s and helped in part to secure a 30-year sentence against Justin Volpe. He was the police officer convicted of sodomizing Louima. But then Thompson went into private practice and perhaps most famously represented the hotel maid who accused Dominique Strauss-Kahn, that that was the leader of the International Monetary Fund, of rape. Two very high-profile, racially charged cases. What influence do you think those kinds of cases had on him as a high-profile district attorney? I think that he was someone who naturally sought high-profile cases. He was also sort of interested in issues of race. He obviously became Brooklyn's first black district attorney. I think that the Louima case um, was in large part a matter of luck on his part, uh, but certainly his representation of Nafasatsu Diallo, the hotel maid, was not. Um, he very actively sought representation of her, and he very controversially turned that case into a wedge against the Manhattan District Attorney, who I spoke to just today, and Guy Vance very candidly and honestly acknowledged to me that although he and Ken Thompson got off on the wrong foot way back when during that case, they had since become really good friends. His controversy during the DSK case, as it came to be known, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, uh, is the reason many people were surprised when he ran for district attorney. And then, of course, when he got into office, one of his big challenges was prosecuting the officers involved in the shooting death of Akai Gurley, the unarmed man shot in the stairwell, uh, the public housing stairwell in Brooklyn. And then Thompson pursued a conviction, uh, ultimately recommending, though, no prison time for the officer, Peter Leung, who fired the shot. Surprising choices on both counts. Surprising, or you can look at it also as very Solomonic. I think both decisions on his part were very difficult. The district attorneys, not just Thompson, but all DAs, have um, very close working relationships with police officers, and there's a natural hesitation on their part to um, think very hard and very long before prosecuting cops. Thompson, in this case, made what turned out to be a difficult and one could say courageous decision to push forward with the prosecution, but because that particular case, a rookie cop patrolling a public housing project in a darkened stairwell at night and by all accounts firing his weapon accidentally and then by pure chance the bullet ricocheting and striking its victim, Akai Gurley, and killing him, these were factors that mitigated against pursuing a really tough sentence against Peter Liang. And so Thompson made another tough call and he recommended no prison time. And it was a decision that earned him the great disdain of Akai Gurley's family that prompted very, very bitter protests on the part of criminal justice activists in New York City. Some of those protests taking place in the middle of the night outside of Thompson's own home in Brooklyn. And so when I spoke to him about these two decisions, he was very pained about them both. And 
really labored over making them. Let's talk for a moment about the Central Park jogger case. It's back in the news because Donald Trump has just said he still believes the teenagers, four black, one Hispanic, who were convicted and ultimately exonerated through DNA evidence. Trump is still insisting they were guilty. Uh, Even in the face of the DNA prosecutors have, generally they tend to fight reopening of cases. But Ken Thompson was actively looking for cases that the Brooklyn DA's office had wrongfully prosecuted. How innovative or even revolutionary uh, is that? Well, he did not create the the conviction review unit in Brooklyn. Joe Hines, his predecessor, had implemented the unit way back when, but Hines had understaffed it. And it, it just, amongst Hines' various priorities, that was not one of them. Thompson came in with a very different point of view. I think part of it was racially inflected, because if you look at the numbers of wrongful conviction, they are, like many things in the justice system, skewed towards minority communities. And so Thompson came in and he really staffed up that unit. And he hired internally really, really top-line prosecutors to manage it on the day-to-day. He brought in people from the outside world who had been involved um, for, for years in the innocence movement. And if it wasn't revolutionary, it was certainly something that became a national model. Ken Thompson ultimately recommended vacating convictions in 21 cases. Did he meet any resistance? I think that any time that you implement one of these offices, you run the risk of a conviction review unit being seen from within as a kind of internal affairs, as a kind of rat squad. So I know that there is an inherent tension when you set up a unit like this. But I also know from talking to the people on the conviction review unit that it's extremely rewarding work because in many prosecutors' offices, there's a culture of winning that sometimes doesn't have a lot to do or is, is apart from finding out what actually happened, seeking the truth. And what these conviction review units do, their mandate is to just follow the facts and to find out what really happened and to seek the truth. Ken Thompson was in office such a short while. Is there a thread of his work to continue to weave into the fabric of a longer legacy? I think that from talking to a lot of people and knowing that office, I think that he both reflected a couple of trends and helped push them forward. He embodied them and advanced them. And those would simply be that at this moment that we all have been watching, this long moment of tension between law enforcement and the communities, whether that's minority communities or other, Thompson was a guy who came into office promising to restore a sense of racial justice to Brooklyn. And so, you know, that legacy was was a meeting of man and moment in a very fortuitous way. Alan Foyer is a reporter with The New York Times. He joined us to discuss Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson, who died yesterday at the age of 50. Governor Cuomo has said he will appoint Thompson's replacement. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Saturday, October 15th, 2016. So I have been told this is our compensatory call in. Uh, Feel free to share thoughts, observations, uh, suggestions. The number to dial 641 715 Four zero. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. That number again six four one seven one five three six four zero. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Quickly, before uh, we nab some of the folks uh, who dialed in who have a hand up, um, number one, the I don't know if it was the first clip, I think it was the second uh, news clip that played today from the Young Turks where they were talking about the 
uh, black female here in the Seattle area. Her name is Trish Doolin, where they didn't, they wouldn't cash her check at the bank. They didn't believe her and had to call and uh, verify and all that uh, nonsense. I think I talked about it before in the program, but that happened to me. This is not workplace racism, but uh, I can't say I experienced that directly, and I think those sort of incidents, in my view, that should not be described as uh, microaggression uh, some way of minimizing it, that is racial terrorism, specifically economic terrorism, uh, for you to go and work whatever your check is. I wouldn't care if it's $5, $5,000, whatever, whatever it is. You earned it, your funds, and you go to the bank like anybody else with your ident- identification to cash your check. And, you know, then it's got to be all this, you know, we need a urine sample and a birth certificate and you know do you have uh you know your maternal grandmother available and can we see her dental i mean it's like come on man what is this uh, and I, I i can remember specifically two aspects of this when it happened to me personally i went to the bank i had identification i think i might have even had two different pieces of uh identification uh, and i had my check they wouldn't cash it. I, uh, it happened enough times this specific time. I don't remember what the reason was. I, I know there was one specific time where they would not cash it because they called and could not verify with my employer. I don't know if that was the case this time. But anyway, this time that I'm remembering, I left and I had a white friend at the time and he also used the same bank. I went back uh, and got him. Actually, we went to the bank down the corner, so we went back to a different bank, which is key because the check that I was getting cashed was issued by the very bank that rejected me, right? So my job, I went to their bank. It would have been much easier to verify, and this is from your account and everything. No, denied. So I go get my white friend. We go to his bank, which is like a block down the corner. We go to his bank. They cash it in like... Five minutes, and the white teller is looking at me, and she's like, uh, why didn't they just cash it at the other bank? And I'm sitting there like a moron, like, uh, white supremacy, white supremacy. Uh, the other aspect of that story, this is all me. It happened exactly to me, and I'm sure this is widespread. That's why I say all the time it's so important to share on workplace racism. Um, and I think I discussed this before. I'm just reiterating. Um, there, w- there was a white male. He was in charge of the finances for the job. Uh, So I went in to the main office where he was located and I'm there for whatever other reason. And he's like, Oh, Hey, what's up? And he says, uh, he just starts laughing. He says, you know, out of all the people, all the employees that we have, you're the only one the bank calls to verify, to see that you're one of our employees. The only one. And he just cracks up laughing. He says, you know why they do that, don't you? (laughs) It's because you're black. (laughs) And he just thought this was so uh, funny. But he tells me this. I don't remember at the time uh, it being anything other than, yes, I know. I've had this problem. I came to the same conclusion. Like, that's what I recall at the time. But I don't remember, like, documenting and, you know, clear evidence uh, coming from the person that works there, what have you. But that happened to me. I could totally relate to her. And those sort of, of just daily humiliations, again, terrorism, that's why I think it's important, black mental health, and I think that leads to a lot of the self-destructive uh, behavior and just a lot of how racism just wears you down gradually when you have to deal with those types of things all the time. Other thing uh, I was going to make sure I got it, just uh, from that same uh, report, that was the Young Turks, right? Um, they said... Uh, this was Sank, the host. He said, how I would think about this if I was a conservative. And then he went to make all these excuses saying, oh, it wasn't racism. It was, you know, they probably, she just had a new account or they just didn't know her. She hadn't banked there long enough. And in my view, that's really important when they try to make it seem as though only the racists are quote unquote conservatives. Uh, that major act of confusion, that's how you end up with what you heard later in the news clips where someone says Donald Trump Many black people think he's a racist. Hillary Clinton, she's just not popular. It's not, they think Donald Trump is a racist, and they think Hillary Clinton is a racist. When you think of it as the conservatives are the racists, if you're not a conservative, you're not racist, that very much, very much puts you in danger uh, of having a race soldier and you failing to recognize them as an enemy to black people. And that happens a lot uh, within racism from that same segment. Um, 
where later on it was a different panelist for the Young Turks where he said uh, they asked him if they, if they thought it was racist what the bank did and not cashing her check. And he said, well, it could be sexist. It could be racist. Uh, I think that's another classic tactic that they will try to deviate away from racism. That happens on a regular basis. And just for the record, uh, Trish Doolin, black female, she did not mention sexism at all uh, in her post online about this incident. She labeled it banking while black. She didn't say this was, you know, an incident of sexism and patriarchy. Uh, at the bank, she seemed to think that the problem was they were mistreating her because she was black. Just in my view, another way that white supremacy racism is practiced. Uh, one other thing I'll get in before I get to the phone lines. I have been saying uh, for the end of, I was going to say for the entire week, but that is not accurate. I've been saying for much, most of 2016 that District Attorney uh, Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson uh, should not be ridiculed and talked bad about. Uh, you heard a little snippet from earlier this year. I think that was like the spring of this year, the caller in East New York, where she was talking about how frustrated she was about Ken Thompson and what happened with the Peter Leanne case. Um, and it just continued this week, even after he died. Uh, in my view, that is you get a total zero in black self-respect. If you have uh, this is the time when a black father, a black husband dies and it's he was, you know, a no good so and so, and I'm glad to see him gone. That is, in my view, it is a total zero in black self respect. I do not see how that solves any problems, how that will make anything better. Even if you, you know, disagree with the way that Ken Thompson handled the Peter Leanne case, and that's to uh, totally fine. Even if you disagree, okay. What is going to be better for black people now that Ken Thompson is gone? The people who took the position, hey, Ken Thompson messed us over with uh, the killer of Akai Gurley, and uh, it was ridiculous, and, you know, we need somebody in there who's going to stand up and, and get things done and show them what's what and stand up for black people. Okay, now that he's gone, what's going to happen? Is this going to make anything better for black people? And if so, what specifically? And I would want that explained in detail. Uh, I think we do that sort of thing a lot where we gripe and complain about a black person and how they are responding to racism, particularly if they have some sort of official position. Okay, so we get rid of this person. Now, what is going to make this better? Do you need to run? Do we ha need to have a, a specific white person uh, in there who's going to make things really great for black people now? Or is it just we just need to get rid of Ken Thompson and everything will be fantastic? All we need to do is get him out of the way. What exactly is going to be better for black people? That would be the only question I ask. And I would submit this would be another example for me about the whole brother and sister thing. Uh, if, you know, that's keeping it real and if that is somehow working against racism for a black father and a black husband to die and for that to be a time to come out and, yes, he was a no-good coon and a Sambo and an Uncle Tom. Yes, that is exactly what I would want to hear from my fellow black brothers and sisters. Yes. Anywho, uh, the number again, 641-715-3640. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. If you could watch the background noise, that would be super appreciated. Use your mute button if you are not able to, or if you're in a you know noisy environment, people are talking or whatever the case may be, mute yourself and unmute when you're ready to talk say whatever you need and then if you can mute that would be super appreciated um no metaphors for the program please thank you uh that in my view causes a lot of confusion racists use these metaphors specifically to be deceptive and i think a lot of times us victims we just uh in our confusion and just trying the best we can to articulate our views end up using metaphors that are not helpful and or accurate in conveying our thoughts about racism. Uh, if we could just be explicit, obvious, exact about what it is that we're saying, I would super appreciate it. Thank you kindly. Uh, folks who dialed in with a hand up, line should be open. Uh, well, the first few folks who dialed in with a hand up, uh, line should be open. If you have commentary, feel free. Mark Kirk? Yes, sir. Good evening, Josh. Good evening to all the callers. Thomas Smith in New York. I'm going to play some great clips tonight. 
Um, and I agree with you, as I said, about um, Ken Thompson. You know, they've been doing a lot of stuff on him this week. At his funeral was yesterday. Um, a lot of um, people came out that he's free from prison and um, told their stories, heart-touching stories. Um, um, you know, and I, and I said this the other day, but, um, you know, if you Google the city you live in and um, just look at the population or the city you live in and um, think that he's the district attorney of Brooklyn, they have 945,000 black people, just black people, not counting the white people. They got more white people than black people, but now compare that to the city of your city's population, I doubt it. You know, most people don't live in a city with 945,000 people. Um, that's double the amount of people that's in Atlanta. So um, that's not to count the hundreds of thousands of dark-skinned Latinos that pass for black until they talk. Um, so, you know, racist laws are voting Brooklyn. Um, 23 to 22 people he freed, mostly all black. I mean, they were in jail for stuff that obviously they didn't do, just like the guy was in jail for his book bag. I mean, I know he wish he had Ken Thompson as his DA, think his case was in the Bronx. Um, but uh, compare him to your local DA and then see if you have the same rights with him. Um, he took away the weed conviction, which had all the white people who gentrified Brooklyn very pissed because the lack of those weed farms made their taxes go sky high. They were protesting him. Um, and I just wanted to say that about him. Um, he did a lot. Um, he, he could he could have did more, but we're in a system of racism and white supremacy, so his hands are tied. And he's in probably... Um, with 945,000 black people, you could imagine the amount of racism that he has to deal with on a daily basis in Brooklyn. I mean, um, you know, um, I want to say, um, Mr. Trump, um, with all the women coming out now, and I hope this isn't a metaphor, um, but he's, he's getting the nigger treatment. Um, you know, Tiger Woods, Bill Cosby, some of these women 20 years ago, he wrote me on a plane. I mean, it's like I, I just can't stop laughing. Um, you know, I guess he knows how it feels. Um, you know, I hope they continue to get him. Um, don't forget uh, what he did to the Central Park Five, putting that full-page ad out. Like, um, they really did it. And then 20 years later, after they're free, because they didn't do it, he still hasn't apologized to them. He refuses to. So um, let him get what he gets. Um, the, first, the first two clips you played, um, you know, the the education thing, um, it's very difficult. Um, the young Turks, I hate them, that all whites are ignorant. Um, it doesn't matter how educated you get as a black person, you get a lady who's an architect, um, very educated, and um, can't go to the bank and be treated like an architect, she's treated like a nigga. Um, once again, I mentioned the other day, the lady on the plane, a doctor, so a white guy passes out, she goes to help her. She's not treated like a doctor. She's treated like a nigger told to get back in her seat. Um, so um, I, that's just terrible. Um, the junior high schoolers um, playing football, um, took a knee for the national anthem. Um, you know, their families were denied access to the concession stands. Um, just, to, just think of that. You know, you want to go get a hot dog? No, nah, no, nah, the kids took a knee. No niggas go out there. Um, in 2016, and they were hit with a total of 200 penalty yards. I mean, that's an amazing amount of penalty yards, and they still won the game, thank God. But um, not that that even matters. Um, I would have been happy if they didn't play the game and just went home. But um, the, the Voltron effect. And um, I just wanted to say what Maria Abdul-Jabbar said, um, about the revolutionary people, um, uh, revolutionary soldiers and black panthers and things that's been locked since the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, that's a show of white retaliation. You know, that wasn't revenge. <laughs> they ain't never going to be free. Um, that was, that was a, a direct show of their, their power. And, um, you know, now keep doing it and see what happens, you know. And I'm with my locker now, and if it's not a lot of people out, people come back to me. Thank you.
Peace, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, peace. Hold on. Sorry. Um, peace, Gus, and all the other listeners. Um, I just wanted to touch on what you already said, Gus, about them calling it everything but what it is. So they don't call it racism, white supremacy. It's got to be everything else. Um, the white male, uh, I believe he said his name was Desmond in uh, Canada, uh, he, he kept saying our right, not um, as far as non-white people, but he included himself. So, again, um, it's not racism. It's always, oh, it's blue, not white. It's racial bias, not racism, white supremacy. It's sexism. It's always something else. Um, and then when the black male was selling the, the, the other article where he was selling the hoodies and T-shirts on Etsy, and uh, I felt like it was sort of constructive, um, but they had to get him on there saying that all white people aren't racist. Um, they always pull a confused non-white person to say, just like I just said, all white people aren't racist or it's an isolated incident or something like that. Um, and then right after you played that, you played um, uh, President Obama, or maybe that was before, um, President Obama saying something as well about uh, the cops or whatever. And I just thought about your um, one of your old audio clips where it's like, damn Obama or something like that. <laughs> because people tend to blame him or something like that. They always bring up President Obama like, why isn't he doing anything as if any other president before did anything? Um, oh, and then they had another <laughs> black male saying uh, that those three or four bad apples don't represent the whole or something like that. I, I believe that was from the football game. Um, so, again, they just have to get another non-white person to say that it's not all white people. Um, back to the black architect um, article again, uh, and just how they, again, made her go through all that unnecessary ver uh, verification. I felt like it was very uh, racist, of course, but also very unprofessional um, because I feel like, and I know, that uh, white people, they will embezzle, steal, uh, steal identities and things like that and get away with it for years but let a legit black person come in and try to, um, you know, cast their check or whatever, and they get followed, questioned, all that typical stuff. Um, but, yeah, that's about it. Keith. Appreciate that, b Bor. I was going to just say what the, the coach who said that with the football team where some of the players took a knee. Um, when he said that he, it was a few bad apples, like it might have been out of fear um like i had better not get on here and say that it was all of them uh i had better not said so let me just yeah it was just a few of them it wasn't all but it, i mean it was palpable just seeing the interview of how much of a traumatizing effect this event had on him i just wanted to add that for context and i'll even post it so people can actually see the video so you can see him when he's giving the interview Hello, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Hey, greetings, uh, Gus and the listening audience. Uh, this is Puff. Um, just want to make a quick comment. I know you had um, a story on there on Haiti, but I just wanted to share a little bit about um, what I've heard about charities. Uh, I kind of caught on to the charity thing that they don't give all of their money to to the char to the charitable cause that they're supposed to be helping. Um, 60 Minutes did a story about 9-11 uh, and how they were saying how that is the biggest outpouring that they have ever had, like, in America. And I just wanted to focus on Red Cross is not the only one that does this. Um, I forget what charity it was, but that they say that that is the most outpouring that they have ever had. Like everybody gave everything when when nine eleven happened or whatever, and so um, they were saying how you know a lot of that money got got misspent. In other words, it went to administrative salaries, but it didn't go to some of the money went to that cause, but. They don't spend all the money. It was it was just a it was just very interesting how I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it again. I haven't watched it in a few years, but they were saying how you know 
that charity didn't spend all that money on, you know, uh, on on that. And uh, the the um, story that Gus played earlier, um, it made me think about uh, how how the charities like they had only built like three houses or eight houses. It was in the single digits, you know, with Haiti, and but yet, you know. Beyonce and all these people got on on the network television, and uh, you know, it just it just seems like it never goes to the people that you know, and that's that's part of white supremacy also controlling how how much um, money goes toward you know that cause or whatever, and so they adjust it at will. It might be less than ten percent of the actual money going to to that particular cause, and I'll mute my line. Go ahead. Uh, other folks that we have not heard from have commentary? Yes, may I be heard? Yes, sir. All right, greetings, guests, and the rest of the callers. So recently there was a debate between Trump and Clinton, and that was about six days ago. I watched it, and I found it to be nonsense, both of the both of the debates, because especially from Trump, because I noticed that he would not answer the questions directly. It would take the it would take the um, the people who asked the questions about like two or three times for them to ask him the question and then he would get the response. Then he, then he really just rants about what he's going to do for America even though he doesn't elaborate about what he's going to do. And I found that pretty interesting. And um, Clinton is not any better, I've noticed as well, because it's just a lot going on and I feel like Trump is going. I feel like Trump is going to win. I'm not really going. I'm not supporting him, but I feel like I have. I, I feel like there's a chance that he's going to win. But um, other than that, I found it pretty much nonsense. I didn't get much out of it. And there's like this sensation going on around school and social media about this guy named Kenneth Bone who asked a question uh, about something. I'm not sure what he asked about, but. Um, it was just like it was all over the internet about these jokes about him, and I just found it pretty nonsense the whole debate and everything. But um, also about Hurricane Matthew, um, I found that pretty interesting as well because people were talking about that at my school as well, and um, how they how they were bringing back Harambe or something like that. I'm sorry if I use the metaphor, but um, they they just said that um, Harambe was bringing its wrath onto the um, United States and the people that live there or whatever. And I just found it completely nonsense and how people would say this and believe this. But um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for taking my call. Do you, uh, before you leave us, do you want to give a thought about uh, the birth of a nation? I think you were able to check it out. Oh, yes, birth of a nation. I found it pretty, it was amazing, but... Yeah, it was pretty amazing, yeah. Um, I liked it a lot, especially, I learned a lot from it, especially for the fact that um, his flesh was used as wagon grease, and I found that intense. On And in the movie, it showed how the white people hated Nat Turner so much at the end when he was about to get hung or hanged. But, um... What they didn't say, what they didn't show in the movie was that Nat Turner actually made the slaves do the rebellion. Not only not only male slaves, but females and children. And if they didn't, if they refused to do it, he would kill them too. And yeah, I thought the movie was pretty interesting, though. It was amazing. Huh. Right on, right on. Uh, folks have uh, other comments. They want to get in should be with us feel free if we haven't heard from you can i be heard yes sir greetings everyone uh just thinking about the clip on the uh the little league uh situation uh i believe where the uh some of the uh players uh went on a knee uh if you don't know one thing about it, on, especially on that level of uh, quote-unquote sports, 
uh, Little League, uh, especially uh, Little League football. Uh, it's hostile even without that. <laughs> it's a hostile environment even without that, uh, whether it's uh, non-white, non-white people or non-white people and white people in the same atmosphere. It's a hostile environment in the first place uh, because of the, uh, the relationship, the negative relationship a lot of uh, parents have with, uh, in regards to their children. Everybody is looking uh, for the next uh, superstar, quote-unquote, athlete, uh, as opposed to what they say on paper, what these uh, programs are designed for, uh, something of constructive value. It's, it's, uh, a, yeah, I mean, it, it is some situations where individually people are, are actually exercising that, but, but there is a lot of hostility uh, in those environments, even without the idea of, and this is how I always thought about it, uh, with those flags and those songs and the different other uh, uh, cultural uh, gestures that white people uh, have uh, created, basically bragging about how they, how they have uh, mistreated non-white people around the world, uh, uh, especially in this part of the world, uh, they they get very angry when you don't show uh, that you are willing to uh, acquiesce to to that uh, that show of uh, power or bragging about the power that they have and the terror that they have embarked on uh, non-white people. They they get angry about it, uh, and if they could kill you without any uh, repercussions, uh, they probably would do it <laughs> for the most part uh, or, or severely physically punish you in some sort of way, let alone talking about, uh, which happens a lot, uh, and that's, that's what this article is about, uh, saying some things uh, uh, that are, that's called disparaging to uh, that particular person. Uh, in this case, that happens to be a non-white person. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm bragging about how I've, I've terrorized and, and destroyed you and how dare you don't like it. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, that's just what it is. Uh, uh, just a, uh, uh, a observ uh, a, something that was revealed to me, uh, Actually, it was, uh, I think, this morning. We had a meeting, football-wise, had a meeting. And uh, the head coach that I've been working with now since uh, the, uh, the early 90s, uh, he, uh, 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 he, is, he, is, he was the first, uh, actually was the first uh, uh, head football coach on the high school level in the state of Florida. And football is, is huge in the state of Florida. Matter of fact, the state of Florida is known as the football capital of the world when the transition from high school to uh, college. Most of the non-white black males that are in the National Football League are from the state of Florida. And the state of Florida is broken down into counties, and Dade County, Miami-Dade County, is not even close. It's number one as far as, uh, quote-unquote, talent, and that's black males. It, it, it legislates, it goes to black males anyway. Uh, this particular non-white black male that I've been working with, uh, he was the first coach in the state of Florida to win championships at, at different places. Uh, at the particular place uh, that is called Miami Killian Senior High, where he won a uh, state title, uh, the white people at that particular institution, they could care less about it. And I just found out one of the reasonings on why. Uh, when Arenthal James Simpson uh, was uh, identified as, as innocent to the famous trial that we all know about, he quickly knew that he had to move out of not, not only where he, the city or the area where he stayed at, out of the state of California. And if you look at it on the map, he moved in the exact opposite direction. 
in this part of the world that's called the quote-unquote United States to the state of Florida, right down the street. I mean, it's, uh, from where his residence was to Miami Killing Senior High, you could throw a rock and put out one of his windows. Uh, but anyway, uh, after winning the state title, which was the first, I, I actually attended that high school uh, and, gradu- and graduated in 1975 from that, high, that particular high school. Uh, uh, and uh, he actually donated some money towards rings for the, uh, the, the staff and the players. Because he stayed right down the street, some, some of the, the, the uh, young people went down the street to ask him for a donation. He was glad to do it. <laughs> Glad to do, not only glad to do it, he opened up his house for, for entertainment, you know, uh, at his pool and, and different things of that nature. Uh, of course, it may not have been, it not, may not have been purely sincere, you know, uh, anything like that. But nevertheless, just off of hearing about that from, from these white people, <laughs> and when, when the head coach asked for donations from the teachers and staff, you 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 could you could imagine what were the notes that they put back in his mailbox, <laughs> uh, uh, because they found out that uh, simply because of Renthal, Mr. Renthal James Simpson was one of the contributors. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, uh, I, I knew I knew I knew pieces of it. I knew pieces of the story, but I didn't really you know pay that much attention to it. Until he really addressed it the day while while you know we were talking in a in a in a meeting. Uh, last but not least, is the uh, the uh, imp- the uh, history and info on uh, latest info on Haiti. Uh, this uh, terror terroristic and it's, it is it is to my mind no doubt the most terroristic uh, 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 environment in this part of the world uh, that's been going on. Uh, steadily, at least since 1804, at least. Uh, the only difference is uh, with the technology of, you know, seeing things on TV or the radio and whatnot, you know, it's just recently starting to get into the, uh, in the eyesight and earsight of, of, of uh, people. And it's, but like I said, it's been going on for, for a very long time, and it's a classic Example, if anybody wants to know on the vindictiveness of people who classify themselves as white, how, how just, I mean, it's, it's almost visible. You can see it uh, based on this particular uh, uh, pocket of history in itself, uh, uh, how they are willing to, with joy, it's like, it's like you say when you, when you mention your meaning, of race of the white supremacy, it certainly put a big, huge D on dedicated when it comes to uh, directly, right, right in front of, uh, uh, which, which is almost an arm distance of where I'm sitting at right now. You know, when you look at in proximity uh, of Miami uh, to uh, Haiti itself, and uh, uh, my offspring, his mother, came here on a on a on a rickety boat. Uh, uh, that washed up on the shores of West Palm Beach, uh, Florida, back in 1970. Uh, uh, and this is the this is the mother of of my offspring, uh, and uh, so uh, it's it's it just I mean if anybody uh, uh, states that about whether or not they question it as such thing as racist white supremacy, this, that's a classic example. Uh, to whereas they don't have to physically do what they were doing, you know, especially uh, as far as uh, the quote-unquote United States concerned with the Marines being there occupying Haiti in the early part of the 20th century and so on down the, you know, down the road. Uh, they don't have to really even do that because they have, so, they have destroyed the ecology, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure, to whereas a, 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 a strong wind would cause calamity. And it's directly, directly based on the mistreatment and terror uh, of racism and white supremacy. And that, that's, that's all I have to say right now, because I'm pretty sure most people who are listening to me uh, can identify with what I'm saying. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
Other folks that we have not heard from uh, have comments that they want to share. Now I'm here. Yes, sir. How you doing, Gus? Uh, this is my name is B from Philly. How you doing? Uh, greetings, greetings. Good to hear from you, sir. All right. I just want to congratulate you on your show. It's a it's a great show. My wife and I, we listen to it all the time. We listen to it on YouTube, though, but we, we rarely uh, listen to it live. We've been trying to catch up with you, you know, live, and this is the, the, one of the first times I've listened to you live. So um, I just wanted to find out how can we, you know, be more consistent? How can we catch up with the live show? Uh, well, over the next week, uh, we are here every day, same time, 8 p.m. every day, except for tomorrow, uh, it's the Global Sunday Talk on Racism, so that will be on early uh, to accommodate our international uh, listeners. So that's at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Pacific. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, normal time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, every day we'll be on, uh, and we'll be on a week from tomorrow, Sunday, normal time as well, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, for the rest of the time, you can uh, join our Facebook group. It always has the program, date, time, all that information entered. Uh, normally, it's the day before, sometimes even before that, but generally at least the day before uh, with all the information. Uh, you can subscribe to the events. They'll post it there. You can also check uh, our page at Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, they're posted there where same information, date, time, uh, all that is normally posted at least a day in advance of all of our upcoming programs. So those would be the two uh, easiest options uh, to know when all of our programs are going to be coming up. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Gus. But well, I wanted to tell you we really appreciate the show. We really enjoy it. There's nobody out there like you. Like you, you put it down like real nice, and we definitely uh, we definitely enjoy the show. Glad to hear it. Uh, let us know if you have suggestions or if you have problems uh, accessing when the your time and energy. You and you and your uh, you and your wife. We have too many problems to be wasting time. Oh, say it again. I'm sorry. Oh, I just said I hope it's worth your time and energy. We have too many problems to be wasting time. You and you and your wife's time and energy. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I also wanted to speak on the the uh, the, um, um, the Nat Turner movie. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't gotten a chance to see it. But I just wanted to say that the situation that's going down with that, where they're trying to, you know, uh, smear Nate Parker for these rape allegations. I know you guys probably went over this and talked about this already. Um, but it's just uh, it's a very convenient time for them to bring this up. The fact that the, 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 the girl who he supposedly raped, that he was acquit, the, the case that he was acquitted of, she killed herself. As far as I know, she killed herself four years ago, and they're bringing this up now in 2016 as if she just killed herself. Um. It's funny that they bring it up right around the time of this movie, you know, right around the time of the release of the movie. And so we, we all know, we got to know that this is about, this is not about the rape allegation. I mean, the, the rape case, this is about the Nat Turner movie that's coming out, which I see is that as far as I know, there, there, not have, there, there have not been any, many, very many, Movies that were uh, that that depicted slave revolts in U.S. history. You know, um, this is one of the first somewhat mainstream movies. You know, it's independent. It's on like I think uh, it's 2,000 theaters across the country. This is one of the first movies that that have been depicting slave revolts in U.S. history. So, this is a very very important movie extremely important. They do they all the most of the slave movies that I've seen, I don't know if they've ever had any at all any any slave movies that depicted slave revolts, as far as I know, but this is one of the first ones I've ever heard of, uh, especially about Nat Turner, but depicting any slave revolts out of all the slave movies, they've never 
shown a movie, as far as I, as far as I know, depicting a slave revolt in it. And that's pretty significant to me because it's like, how could, how, how could that never have happened? I mean, as far as I know, there were over 200 slave revolts in the United States. So it's, how could that have never happened, that they've never shown a movie that depicted a slave, a slave revolt? So it's, um, you know, I find that interesting. Okay, so I'm done. Oh, okay. Right on. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, Steven Spielberg might uh, submit Amistad, but that notwithstanding. Uh, folks have uh, other comments they wanted to, uh, to share. Anyone we have not heard from, if you had comments you wanted to share, uh, feel free. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Greatest Gus, all the listeners and callers. Just wanted to share uh, two success stories. I think are success stories. Um, <clears throat> one, um, there are two non-white um, older gentlemen who had uh, they were holding grudges against each other, and it got somewhat to the point where the one guy was talking about he's pretty much going to get physical with the other guy. So I um, I used a few tactics that I learned here, and uh, you know I I kind of. I was really codified in my in my speech, so I I, um, I, w- I walked up to the one gentleman and I told him I said, um, well you know we have enough problems as it is being who we are, working at this um, this facility in this type of hostile environment, and I don't think that it, um, it's going to help much with us going at each other. If you know what I mean, I said it exactly like that, and he was like, yeah, you know what, I didn't think about it like that, and I'm I'm going to let it go. So that pretty much ended that situation with with the two gentlemen. Um, The one, he still feels like he don't really want to talk to the other guy, but he he did tell me that there's really no issue um, between the two. But it was getting to a point where they were were, um, pretty much going to get physical with each other. Um, Another success story is um, there's a group out of Plainsville, New Jersey, and they run off the acronym OPEN. I forgot exactly what it stands for. It's Our People Something. It's a younger, um, mainly a, a younger group of um, non-white um, men and women. And um, the one guy I knew from an area where I lived in Newark, he's probably like a few years older than me. Well, I found him on Facebook. And... Um, him and a few other people, I've noticed that they were going around and um, they were stopping, like, uh, they were talking to gang members, and they're getting gang members to, quote, unquote, drop their flag um, and start to uh, look at their environment and change their their habits. So now these um, ex-gang members, they're going around picking up trash in in neighborhoods. Um, They're doing food drives and and clothes drives for for homeless and people that really need it. And um, I also I participated in one of the food drives. Me and my fiance, we drove down there and took a whole lot of food down there. And um, they have something that they call Swag Day, where they give um, just free haircuts to um, just anyone who comes through. It's mainly for kids, but they're pretty much taking care of all non-white people. Um, they're, they're starting a, a pretty good movement. And... Um, I told him about the show. One of the guys, his name is uh, Jack. Uh, I don't know if I should say his full name, but um, I pretty much told him about the show. And um, he said that he's going to pretty much look into it. And um, they're they're moving around New Jersey and going all over different areas, like the worst areas, picking up trash and really doing a lot of things. So I, I'm starting to get inv- more involved with these guys and, like, different little small organizations that is, pretty much doing um, positive things. And also, Gus, I had a question. I, I wanted to know, did you ever give any feedback on um, the guy who, who drove past you in the, um, the landscaping truck and, and gave you a, a few um, visual uh, imaginary shots? What about the uh, landscaper truck that was shooting at me out the window fictitiously? What about it? Yeah, I wanted to know if you ever gave an update, like uh, what happened to him, if they ever called you back and said that 
yeah, we um, reprimanded this guy for doing what he did, or did he ever give any feedback, or did you ever uh, give any feedback on the program? I didn't get, uh, no, I did not give an update. I did talk about this before for uh, listeners. I think this happened like two weeks ago. I talked about it on one of the previous broadcasts, but I did not uh, give an update. They, uh, she said, the female that I spoke with, she said that they would message me later in the week uh, once they, you know, use their GPS and what have you to pick out exactly who this was uh, and discipline him or what have you. But I didn't get it. Uh, I got their contact information, so I will follow up with them and report back and let you all know uh, what they tell me. But this just happened within the last few, earlier this month. Okay. The reason why I ask is because um, I, I had that happen to me recently. <clears throat> There's a, uh, one of the guys at, at my job drove past me on the forklift. And um, it's, one of, it's, it's one of the white guys, one of the few white guys that I actually speak to. So, you, you know, just so, you know, just like you say, you don't want to mm-hmm. look like um, that the guy that just don't want to speak to anyone. So he drives past me, and I throw my hand up, wow. and I says, hey, blank. And then um, he does that. He gives me the finger and let off uh, two rounds, <laughs> and he kept driving. I was like, you know what, this is crazy. Somebody said that this happened to them before. And I kept thinking, like, I was thinking that it was Thomas in New York, and I was like, no, it's not him. It was Gus that said this. And, <laughs> yeah, that just recently happened. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mute. Take that sort of thing uh, seriously, and particularly in this climate, which was the first thing that the employee at the uh, Evergreen Tree Care, that was the company that this race soldier was working for, but I said take that sort of thing seriously. The first thing that she said when I called was, in this climate, I think the day that came weekend that they had the big shooting out here in Washington at the mall where I think five people were killed, uh, about this, I'm not sure if he's white or not. They've been a little ambiguous about that, but uh, where he killed five people uh, at this mall. So in this climate, with all these shootings and gun violence, uh, to be pointing and pretending that you're shooting at somebody, I mean that's totally. Uh, and, and again, these are not microaggressions. This is just terrorism <laughs> and the worthlessness of black life. Uh, other folks, uh, and certainly not appropriate for a workplace environment. Uh, other folks that. We have not heard from. Uh, if you had commentary, feel free. Uh, hello? Yes, sir. Oh, hey. Uh, good evening, good evening. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, the clip, the Young Turks, uh, it, I've made my feelings about them. You know, and every clip just proves why I feel the way about them that I do. And they said, just the way they are just being dismissive of of this woman. And like, oh, no, it's not racism when any other time, they can't wait to use the word racism, like you said, when it's a Republican or a quote unquote conservative, but just but a bank person, oh no, he's you know, he's like unaware. No oh, no, that that person totally knew what he was doing. So just just another example of why I really have this name for them. And they often they often snicker and and do racist jokes about victims. And and you heard and you heard this snickering also from especially from Jenk. You know, just just another reason why I can't take them. And as for the uh, situation in Haiti, I had a, a co-worker who went to visit Haiti and had to stay there an extra few days because of the hurricane. Thankfully, he's back, but it was not pleasant for him, as he stated. So... 
you know, I totally understand what was going on. And the discussion with Amy Goodman and the other woman, where they're talking about the Red Cross, which received so much money, claimed to build 130,000 homes and only six, and it's described as a mistake. Again, this is just so wrong. It's just another way that racism is being practiced because I'm pretty sure if this was listed, if they listed on paper that they built 130,000 homes and when you find out it's only six, that's fraud and a crime. These are the words that should be used. Not a mistake, not an oversight, but fraud, crime, defunding. These are the proper terms. And uh, as for D.A. Ken Thompson, I was really shocked upon his passing. It was Remind me of Dr. Welsing. You hear the announcement that they have a, they have an illness, and then shortly after they pass away. You know, I was expecting him to make a quote unquote full recovery. But what's interesting is what's being set up. Like, like you said, how people are are speaking about him. Now he picked a successor. Gentleman's last name is Hernandez. Could be white, non-white, depending on his last name. Now, this is the man Ken Thompson picked as his successor. Governor Cuomo, who is white, is said to be leaning towards Councilwoman Letitia James. She's a black woman. I have respect for her. But what this is doing is, unfortunately, setting this could be setting up fighting between two, quote-unquote, Two minority communities, and you have, and the person doing this is a white guy who will just be totally absolved of any fallout that may happen. Oh, and uh, speaking of birth of a nation, since I haven't been here for a couple of weeks, have have you guys or any of the listeners heard or read Tim Wise's racist rant against Nate Parker? Uh, I saw portions of it on Facebook uh, where he commented about the needed combination conjoining of anti-racist work and toxic uh, masculinity and patriarchy uh, and how cavalier Nate Parker was in discounting that he did anything incorrect and uh, his privilege uh, for him to deny culpability. I, I saw some of it on Facebook last week. Yeah, uh, I mean, again, it's just really fascinating how someone can be cleared of a crime, but if you're a black person, it doesn't matter. And this campaign against the movie, I remember something similar when the hurricane was released, the Denzel Washington movie. This campaign by the quote-unquote surviving members of the white people that were killed basically ruined Denzel Washington's was one factor in ruining Denzel Washington getting an Oscar for this movie because it was like, how can you reward somebody for... How can you reward somebody 
who was responsible for our loved ones gone. You know, never mind man was cleared of all charges. Never mind, it was proven he was sane, but but they just had it in their minds that someone should that that this, that someone black shouldn't be able to get away with what happened. And this is uh, very similar. You know, uh, meanwhile, like I said, it, it seems like every week there is a case of a white rapist, an actual white rapist, being convicted or admitting to rape. And the judges are doing what Brock Turner's judge did one better. Brock Turner's judge gave him six months, he's out in three. These judges are telling these white rapists, you're not getting prison time. Or you're getting very little prison time. I mean, I just read of one dude, uh, Martin Blake. He faced 100 years in prison. He'll be out in 43 days. And this is a white man who raped, who committed child rape. His 12-year-old daughter he raped. And he's going to be out in 43 days. And I can tell you right now, this white rapist isn't getting anywhere the vitriol Nate Parker is receiving. Neither Brock Turner, neither Austin Wilkerson. We can go on and on. Even the two white boys who are suspected serial rapists who raped a cop in Kansas, they're not getting this hatred that Nate Park is getting. The Blue Eyes Matter, we're told. And that's all I have to say. Mm. Appreciate that, M1. Uh, other folks who dialed in with a hand up, uh, if you had commentary, you should be with us. Feel free. Can I be heard? May I be heard? Oh, you go ahead, sis. I'll go after you. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Go ahead. Hello, Gus. Hello, callers. Uh, Miss Meds here calling in. Uh, I wanted to speak to what we were talking about earlier, how white people can prevent you from cashing your check and things like that. Um, not only can they prevent you from cashing your check, but they can uh, keep you outside waiting in the rain when they just spoke to you on the phone when you attempt to work for them that day while they verify who you are. And then in the same day, the dentist that you're supposed to work with can tell you black people aren't into dentistry. Um, the next order of business, I would like to thank all of the people who stopped by my channel, uh, my Twitch channel last week to watch Mafia 3, uh, Medicinal Gamer. I got lots of people who came and said, I heard you on the couch. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty cool. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit of what was going on with the sound last week because I found out something rather interesting. Um, come to find out, the game has been uh, designed so that if you are streaming this game, the people will not hear music. They will not hear any of the audio or any of the cutscenes. And um, I did some Google schmoogling to find out uh, if, if this was true or not, and come to find out it is. It was designed that way. And in order to circumvent that, you need some $300 piece of equipment called a capture card, or either you needed a review copy directly from the developers. Um, and the reason 
that I found a lot of uh, white people saying that they did this to the sound. They made posts about, um, specifically it said, the developers didn't want the cutscenes to be taken out of context. The next masterpiece that is um, upcoming in the gaming world that's supposed to be a uh, social justice shove down your throat type of situation um, is called Watch Dogs 2. And um, I've been looking at this one, and I just Googled Watch Dogs and Racism. Perhaps we can find out, because this is also an all-white studio with um, a person who is a writer of this game who is a white person as well. I don't know. Maybe we could get them on the show. His name is Jonathan Morin, and the other guy's name is Danny Belanger. If <laughs> their names are kind of difficult to spell, so you might want to figure, um, uh, go check that out on their Wikipedia page. Um, but I read this interesting post by a... Uh, written by a black person who reviews or who has reviewed this game, and I'd like to read a couple of his uh, paragraphs. Um, over on the Steam forum, oh, sorry, excuse me. Over on the forums for Steam, which is uh, a, um, a place where people buy game PC game, a streaming service through which people will be able to play the game this fall. Though nearly every single conversation about Watch Dogs 2 was about Marcus's race. In the now closed thread titled Shoehorned Black Character, Why Can't We Be Aiden, which is a white person who is the, in the original Watch Dogs, hundreds of disgruntled fans vented their frustrations about how implausible it would be for a black person to live in San Francisco. Look at the demographics of San Fran. It would be more plausible if I played as a homo or as an Asian than some random black dude, says a user. I'm not going to say his name. Considering they make up 6% of the population in San Fran. Most of the 45-page long thread is chock full of different spins on the idea that black people somehow don't make sense as protagonists in general, let alone tech-savvy hero heroes in the Bay Area. Even though the initial thread was locked down by Steam's moderators, a number of other slightly less explicitly racist threads sprang up overnight. Um, <laughs> so that was in my research today about Watch Dogs 2. If you'd like to hear, um, I found a post. Uh, this was actually uh, written by some coherent white people trying to have a, a, well, somewhat coherent conversation about the uh, racism that's supposed to be in this game. Maybe I could show that later. Grant, uh, before we get to Roz, I just had two quick uh, questions uh, from Charlotte Green's visit earlier this week that generated a lot of commentary. She shared that she uh, consumed about an eighth of an ounce of cannabis per day. Um, number one, um, on a, just for one day and consume of, of how much that is for one person. Uh, and then how would you convey to someone who does not consume cannabis at all? How would you try to explain to them? How would you try to qualify what one eighth per day for one person to consume? How would you explain that to someone who doesn't consume cannabis at all? Okay, I couldn't really hear the first question that kind of cut out. But um, the, the first question was ahead. one one eighth of cannabis, one eighth of an ounce of cannabis per day for one person. What is your impression about you know that volume of consumption? Oh wow, an eighth a day is like baller. Like she, I mean, I'd imagine she's <laughs> she's like the the owner of the club, so that's probably nothing to her. But I mean, an eighth is supposed to last you like two weeks. An eighth is like um, if you were to have a sandwich, uh, like a little sandwich bag, and say like you put a handful of like 
uh, you know, sugar or, you know, like a cup and a half of sugar, that's how much like an eighth of wheat is. Okay. And like if you were explaining this to someone who didn't consume at all, uh, if we were going to translate this to beer with like a 12 pack in one day, would that be a equivalent to one eighth? Oh, no, this is like several, you're talking about like several, like, you know, fifths of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> she's got, I mean, like, I, I, I would probably roll six blunts with, like, an A, but she's, I don't, I, I went back to go view her, um, some of her content on YouTube, and, I mean, she rolls these blunts that are, like, cigars, like the entire ace in a cigar. Hmm. All right. I hope that's, uh provides better context uh, for folks who do not consume so you have a, a grasp of uh, what an eat would uh, would equal to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, I mean, I'm not the richest person in the world. I've got to make an eighth stretch, like, you know, like as long as they can, like a, mu- a month, you know, pinching off a, a whole eighth a month. <laughs> She's mm. got an eighth a day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even when I had, because um, I used to have a uh, a caregiver, so you kind of wait the whole year for them to grow and do their thing, and they kind of just hand you, you know, um, you're supposed to be getting an ounce a month. So they would, I mean, my dude was kind of for me, so I never really got the whole 12. Sometimes I would, be, I would get only get eight, but hey, I'll take eight. Um, and even when I had that large amount, I wasn't, like, going through an eighth a day. I mean, like... Um, maybe I'm just extra conservative, but <laughs> that's got to last me. Those eight ounces have to last me the entire year. Hmm. Got it. Got it. Uh, I can can tell folks for the states where it has been legalized, that has been like one of the clearest impacts thus far. I haven't seen this much on the enforcement end, but pricing-wise, uh, like, it's drastic. Like, that probably has a, a big impact on because it's legal in Alaska, so I'm sure they've had the same dramatic price drop, so it probably is a lot less pricey mm-hmm. in those areas. But. Yeah, you can get, like, an ounce for, like, 100 bucks sometimes. Right, of, right. Yeah, really good stuff. Uh, Roz, were you going to comment, sir? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, greetings to you, Gus, and to all the callers and the listeners. Um, yeah, I've had a pretty interesting evening, but just dealing with my family, but I just made it home not too long ago, and I was trying to listen as best I can, so I caught some things. Um, I wanted to touch on the, on the hurricane. Um, I forget who it was that I was speaking about. I believe it was the mail caller before the last caller. And um, my father-in-law actually worked at Trenton State Prison at the time that they were housing uh, the hurricane. And he had talked about this. Now he's like 88 with um, Alzheimer's, so it's just like a whole different story as far as his memory and his mind state. But um, when he did talk about it on the, on the few occasions he did, I remember he said that um, from the moment he met him, he said there's just some prisoners you meet um, as a correction officer for like, 35 years, um, he said there was a there's just some people you meet in prison who you just know are innocent from the time you meet them, you know, and he said that um, that Hurricane Carter exuded that from the moment they met. He said he was a really pleasant guy, kind of kept to himself uh, quiet, low-key, and um, he talked about, um, you know, the, the com- some of the conversations that they had. He said they had some really uh, deep philosophical conversations, and um, he, he admired him for how he dealt with what was being done to him by white supremacists, and um, he said he also looked out for him quite a bit as best he could. Him and um, the, some of the other black uh, correction officers in Trenton State Prison did look out for him when he when he was there. Um, so yeah, it, I mean the things that white people will do just to you know make any black person suffer. You know, even if it was a black person who committed the crime, the idea is that they don't care. You know about accuracy again. It, it just goes back to even what you talked about when that person um, when you got into that. Um, online uh, discussion with the person who, you know, tried to berate you for um, trying to clarify misinformation, and it's the same thing. You know, they don't really care about accuracy. They just want to, you know, make any black person suffer. And to me, um, just to 
even piggyback off of that situation, those are the types of things that can happen when you don't care about accuracy and, um, you know, you can just make, you know, statements that aren't, you know, just aren't accurate. And, and you know, it's just something that I thought about when the previous call was talking about that. Um, I found it to be very uh, sickening and nauseating about the disrespect of, um, of uh, Ken Thompson uh, after his passing. Um, I think a lot of times we sometimes rush to judgment and the idea is that you have to look at excuse me, at a person's whole life, not just at specific incidences in which uh, you might not be happy with something that, you know, might have transpired. And the idea is if you really had an understanding of the system of white supremacy, you would see that he really did the best that he could within that situation um, to try and, uh, you know, get some semblance of justice. So at least on the law books, this man was guilty. Um, and he had to, excuse me, as a black male, he had to walk a very, you know, a, he just had to do things in a specific way in order to protect himself and also try to get justice for the family in the best way that he could. And, again, you just have to look at his whole life, not just the Akai Gurley incident. And um, as you look at his whole life, you'll, you'll start to understand that, you know, he has way more, he's done way more um, to help black people um, in, the, in the prison industrial complex in slavery, basically, um, than probably anybody else as far as in, in, in law, um, who because he's the only person who's had that position. So ultimately, you know, he's he garnered quite a bit. He should garner quite a bit of respect and um, and admiration for the work that he did do. So I just felt kind of disgusted by that. And um, I wanted to touch on the Young Kirks. I just hate them. I, I can't stand their voices. I can't stand their position on things. They're just so racist and um. Their perceptions are just so, would be so confusing to people who may be more confused about white supremacy because of the verbiage that they use. I find them just nauseatingly disgusting. And um, when uh, Cenk Uger said that he didn't think that um, the guy might necessarily be racist, um, he didn't think that the guy sits around saying that he hates black people, but this is the type of implicit black bias that he was talking about. And it's just like, what is implicit bias? <laughs> like that these statements, these phrases, these, you know, combinations of words that white people put together um, that sadly a lot of black people also tend to attach themselves to because white people make these phrases popular, which I think um, just in, for the sake, again, of accuracy, you know, black people need to formulate our own language, which, you know, thankfully we have counter racist language that is accurate in describing these things as racist white supremacist actions. You know, all of these layers of different uh, words to obfuscate reality, and, and a lot of, you know, black people sadly get even more confused, and they'll think um, that Cenk Uger and his uh, cohorts are not racist, which they're explicitly racist. It's just the way they present their racism is much more codified. So, you know, black people and, and other non-whites will tend to be more confused behind uh, the way that they speak about incidences. And then um, I thought about the, the clip you played in regards to the 13-year-old um, black children in Central Park. Um, that were basically racially assaulted um, due to them not uh, standing up for the national anthem. And I just say, um, you know, anywhere in the United States, you're going to experience intense racism. It has nothing to do with whether you're in the northern part of the country or the south. Um, it's, it's just a terroristic country from east to west, north to south. It doesn't matter where you are. And I just think that if you, as a black person who plays any sport, will not stand for the anthem of the country in which you are playing and which you reside because of racism, white supremacy, you should not play for those same races. I would say, and even though I think today is we're in a different day and time where I don't even think black people could get away with creating their own sports leagues, which I think would be very, very good. And sadly, when we did have our own sports leagues, they were very successful. And, you know, white people tried to get us to, to leave the Negro baseball leagues and um, all of these other black uh, sports leagues that we created to play with them. And in so doing, we lost an extremely um, great way to keep money in the black community as well as uh, basically control the reality of how sports plays out in our communities. So, I, you know, I was just thinking, even though I don't think today it's a good, it, it would be uh, – I don't even think white people will let black people create their own leagues like before, but I was like, hey, you know, maybe we should have our own leagues specifically for black people, and we don't even have to say the anthem at, at, at these events at all, you know. Um, but I just think, it, I just think that it's, it's really interesting that we continue to play, 
you know, for these same races, yet we, in, you know, in, in honor of the disrespect or not uh, sta- uh, standing for the disrespect that we've been put through, we choose not to stand for the anthem, but we play for the same white racists who created the anthem that we're not standing for. So um, with that, thank you for taking my call, and I'll meet my line. Uh, let's see. Uh, other folks that we have not heard from, if you have a hand up, uh, your line should be open. Feel free. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, Greetings, everyone. Greetings, Gus. Uh, This is Ken Steele uh, calling from Chicago. I'm uh, currently in Michigan at the moment. Um, I wanted to begin uh, this week's program by uh, addressing uh, Birth of a Nation. Um, I did not get a chance to uh, discuss it last week. Um, I saw the film. It was excellent. Um, I think it is one of the best movies that I've ever seen and one of the most cleverly executed movies that I've ever seen. Um, this is a uh, movie is best viewed after seeing D.W. Griffith's um, A Birth of a Nation uh, simply mm-hmm. because uh, you get the full context of what Nate Parker is doing with his decisions uh, in this film. So uh, it's awesome in the way that it portrays uh, the era of slavery as not over. Um, It's just surprising how uh, similar the interactions are between the characters in the movie uh, and how they parallel to the interactions that we see between people uh, today. So I think... Birth of a Nation is one of the best movies that I've ever seen um, in movie theaters uh, regarding the system of racism, white supremacy. And I think the end is one of the best endings that I've ever seen in a film uh, as well. One of the complaints that I have about the movie is that uh, black people are shown, uh, well, black bodies are shown um, throughout the movie Um, corpses, uh, hanging black bodies, in a way that the white bodies are not displayed. White Mm -hmm. bodies are not not seen, um, you know, rotting in gutters. They're not seen swinging from trees. So this is something that disturbed me a little bit, but um, I just think that the movie was excellently um, executed, and um, everybody here should see it. Even if you do have a policy of not seeing slave movies, this one is definitely worth checking out, especially in theaters. Now, regarding the societal reaction to this movie, um, it's not surprising that there is this much backlash uh, to the film. I mean, the the movie basically advocates uh, black people um, engaging in violent counter-violence to, uh, as a means of eliminating the system of white supremacy. And it does so in a way that is just so, uh, I, I want to say righteous, that, I mean, it's hard to argue against other than throwing out a bunch of, uh, um, uh, a bunch of arguments that uh, do not pertain to the film directly. Uh, one thing that I will say is that um, I'm particularly disturbed by the gender warring that is spurred on um, by this film. Um, too many people are, uh, too many non-white uh, black people are, in my opinion, are going after a particular gender, um, either black men or black women or this, that, or the other, um, or uh, the way that this movie has been received in theaters. Um, it's just, uh, it's not productive. And anytime I see it, I simply just unfollow the people or I block them. Um, I, I simply just don't have the time for, to hear uh, black people talking about this gender or that gender is more responsible for our suffering. It's just, uh, no. And then there's another phrase that I'm hearing a lot in these discussions is accountability. We need to be held accountable, hold these people accountable. And I asked one of these people uh, using this phrase to define accountable, and they essentially defined scolding. And I just, I I really don't like, uh, I I don't think it's constructive to uh, engage in genderized discussion when discussing the issue of race. I feel like when we do 
uh, get into these gender wars, especially with respect to black people, it's just not constructive. Another complaint that I hear people saying is that this movie is historically inaccurate. And a lot of the people making this claim, I suspect, um, are not making the same claim about any other Hollywood movie that uh, is being shown. These same people are the people who will uh, take a look at, um, you know, Titanic, for instance, and they have, I, 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 I'm willing to bet money that most of these people have never, ever uttered uh, the words historically inaccurate in reference to that movie. So, uh, the fact that they're suddenly concerned about historical accuracy about this movie uh, is very suspicious to me, and I suspect that they are not uh, worried about historical accuracy. This is just uh, another excuse that they have to uh, admonish black people, and it's just um, <laughs> it's very bothersome. Uh, um, one th- another thing that I want to note is that um, uh, this week, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was uh, noted for criticizing uh, Kaepernick's protest. Uh, I think she called it, um, uh, she called him arrogant, um, which I think is a, a modern, updated version of the term uppity. Um, I think that uh, she called it stupid. Um, and this is, you know, just a number, she just had a number of insults. Um, for uh, Kaepernick's protest. He even co- went ahead and compared uh, his protest to flag burning. And um, uh, there was a backlash for this because uh, apparently, I didn't know this, but uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is hailed as, I'm going to use the word hero, um, uh, by many people that identify themselves as liberals and progressives. And I think, from what I'm able to discern, a key tenant, a cornerstone of the liberal-slash-progressive agenda is not seeming racist. I I don't think that they're obsessed with, you know, uh, ending racism or dealing with racism or anything like that, but they are keen on not appearing to be racist. So she was uh, was excoriated um, in the in the press, and a number of people um, uh, must have reached out to her because in reaction to the backlash, um, she released a press release um, uh, basically uh, saying that her words were, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, were incorrect or um, she was a bit uh, foolhardy in making her statements. Um, and uh, but if you read the press release, um, nowhere in there does she take back what she says. Nowhere in there does she say that she was wrong, um, and she definitely did not apologize for her words at all. Um, and in the reaction to this, I saw a number of people, uh, you know, saying how sad that they were. And one of the people that uh, had one of the more popular. Um, status updates uh, regarding this situation was um, W. Kamau Bell, who was a former uh, guest on the context of white supremacy. And I asked him, I asked him, uh, you know, you know, I, I was just wondering why was he surprised and why did he consider this person to be a hero, um, you know, for, for black people. And then he responded that this was more of a um, progressive liberal thing, and you know, I, I just informed him that I don't think that progressives or liberals have you know the interests of black people at at their heart, and you know, we kind of parted ways. I didn't want to pick a fight with this guy um, simply because I am moving to the West Coast, and I just don't want any more bad beef with comedians. Um, and so he just, uh, you know, he is, um, you know, he he was just surrounded by a number of people who were getting at me for even you know suggesting that this person was racist. So. I think that um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, must have been practicing a very sophisticated form of racism up into all this time for so many people to be surprised that she is, in fact, a racist. And that brings me to my last point um, regarding the election. Uh, 
One thing that I'm noticing uh, a lot is uh, something that was mentioned earlier in this uh, broadcast that uh, Hillary Clinton is not being brought up uh, as a or being mentioned as a racist, um, and Donald Trump is. In fact, um, people are oftentimes juxtaposed the two by you know saying that Hillary Clinton is not a racist or that she's against racism or something uh, to that effect, and that Donald Trump is. Uh, in fact, the documentary uh, the Thirteenth. I've noticed that in their uh, marketing and advertising, um, they frequently play the clip of uh, Donald Trump saying, uh, you know, he wants to make America great again or something like that, and then they'll juxtapose that with images of black people um, protesting and being beaten up and whatnot. And it's interesting, whenever they play the Super Predators uh, bumper or clip or um, preview, they never show an image of Hillary Clinton. They don't even show her saying the phrase Super Predator. But she's in the movie um, in the beginning um, very briefly, or in the uh, exposition very briefly. And uh, another thing that I've noticed is that uh, they are making it out that any black person that is not for Hillary Clinton is stupid. That clip that you played of Bill Maher being very dismissive um, to the idea that uh, black people are concerned about Hillary Clinton's racism uh, is something that I see echoed just throughout society. And I even saw an update from CNBC uh, that had um, Omarosa flanked by a number of notable uh, black Trump supporters. And uh, it said that the Trump train is coming um, choo-choo. And I'm seeing this and I understand that, you know, uh, some Trump supporters refer to their movement as the Trump train, but I thought it was very, very telling that they used that language and that imagery of all of these black people supporting Donald Trump. If you guys are uh, probably aware, there is online, um, forwarded by Tariq Nasheed, um, this uh, notion of a, of a coon train. And I don't think that this was missed uh, on other black people because I saw some notable black people sharing that link, um, including former Apprentice uh, contestant Claudia Jordan. She was uh, sharing that link, and she was saying, coon this and coon that. And I've never seen her using that kind of language, and I've never seen a number of other black people using that kind of language uh, referring to other black people. But this is just something that I've seen that's notably different. And because of this... I suspect that a Donald Trump presidency would be more constructive than a Hillary Clinton uh, presidency. Um, right on. I think we will uh, oh, leave it there. I want to make sure oh, we sorry. get to some of our other folks. And we'll, uh, if we have time, we can come back. No apologies needed. We'll uh, swing back to you. Uh, any folks that we missed completely, any people that didn't get an opportunity to share at all? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, good evening to the callers. Good evening, Gus. Um, this is Jay uh, from New York. Uh, just wanted to contact and connect with everyone. Wanted to make a quick update on my grandmother and Haiti and the family. Um, as I missed the first part of the show, um, my family in Haiti and my grandmother are definitely pulling things back together. Uh, many people um, in the area are still struggling, as we kind of see on all these crazy newscast that they're throwing people in front of, but um, there's still a ton of impacted folks in the area still trying to kind of repair from the trouble that they were having even from the last activity that happened there. But um, it's just um, really difficult to see the loss and even to hear um, as I talk to some of my family members there um, just the, the total devastation of what's going on. Uh, the saddest part, I think, is uh, being able to talk to some of the elders in the family and just seeing how um, disconnected their reality. And, and I know this is just kind of from many, many years of just facing um, the, the racism, white supremacy, and action type tactics that they've been through, that we've been through. Um, they just don't put the connection together that this is happening from that source. Um, 
you know, whether they're just saying that it's just par for the course right now and things will get better, but nobody is kind of connecting the dots um, to that this is kind of happening from, and, and I guess I won't say nobody because it's speaking for everyone there, but uh, for the majority of people that I've spoken to and in, in my family and even the ones here in the New York area, um, no one just connects the dots, even with the Clinton activity and, and not getting resources to us and there's just kind of just this void of putting the blame where it belongs. And, and that's difficult for me now that I've become more informed uh, by this vehicle here and even by just doing my, my own reading and research. So just wanted to kind of give a quick update there. Um, as I mentioned, I missed the first part of the show. Um, I did go to see Birth of a Nation tonight. I agree with Ken totally. I saw D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation last week. Uh, prior to going to see this uh, Birth of a Nation, and um, great movie, um, uh, just just amazing. Um, sad to see that there were only 15 to 20 people in the theater on a Saturday at, like, key movie hour. Um, but again, I guess it's to be expected um, with with the victimization that, uh, that we've gone through, but a uh, very powerful movie. Uh, the images, um, again, I'll kind of agree, the images that I saw of the black bodies, we're so used to seeing that in so many different areas. I wish they would have probably done that in the opposite um, because I didn't see enough of those bodies, but um, I definitely felt the movie was uh, extremely powerful. Um, and then one last thing, just wanted to kind of concur with, I think it was Ross that said this about the Young Turks. There was something always eerie about their positioning as I started seeing them kind of appear online. Um, the more I became informed, the more it started to make sense as to what their strategy was. So um, I definitely agree with um, the sentiments that uh, Russ made in regards to um, to what their you know what their agenda is. So uh, that's all I had. I'll, I'll mute my line. Thank you. Uh, the mail caller in Florida. Uh, were you going to comment, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, yes, uh, greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners and callers. I had a, a few interesting observations from this week because um, like, I thought about some comparisons. Like, I, I think he played the, um, the uh, news report about the, I think it was it the flight attendant, I don't know if it was played in the audio segments, but I know it was it was going around the line with that black female. Like the, I guess the people on the on the flight didn't think that she was a doctor, and like I was thinking about that and how like I was looking at a news segment where uh, Tim Tebow they said you know like the the words she used that he was being praised. I guess like you know. They brought in a religion, the religious aspect to it, that he, I guess he he laid hands on somebody that was having a seizure, um, you know, and didn't really have any kind of medical expertise. But I guess, you know, his expertise is that he's a uh, classified as white. And, you know, just think about like that, that one comparison. Um, the, the second one was, I think they, uh, like, well, I read that they had a, report about, I guess, Floyd Mayweather, um, giving his viewpoint about protests of uh, Colin Kaepernick. And, you know, of course, uh, victims pretty much uh, criticized him or gave their view on what he said. And I just recently seen that it was uh, some some uh, white lady, I guess she was singing uh, the national anthem, and apparently she guess she kneeled, I think, toward the end of it. Like, I don't, I ain't never really seen this person before. I guess she, she well, she looks like she was classified as white to me. And, um, like, one, one last thing I wanted to point out was, it was a story that I had found out about, about, like, a day ago, where, like, it's this high school over in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, this, I think this is a white teacher. But, like, when when I first started looking at the video, like, they had the, um, the voice changer and the silhouette of the student that was in the classroom. And this teacher was apparently doing a lecture about 
saying to be white is to be racist. So that like that language sounds so familiar. So it was a uh, they they played like the um the cell phone video of the student. I'm think this I'm thinking this is a white female student, and she was saying like how she was so uncomfortable and you know it made me feel bad and I don't know what he's talking about. And he was like he was playing this video of um this guy taking out a bottle of white out and marking over some uh, geographical area on a globe, and they're writing the white name on it, I guess talking about the term they use, uh, colonization. And, uh, you know, he was saying, you know what, I am, I, I'm white, and I'm a racist, and, you know, I do things, I participate. I mean, he was saying the whole thing on the, on this recording, so I'm assuming this is a white teacher. And uh, I guess she, this, this female student, took this video home, but I don't think the teacher got fired or anything. He was saying that he just wanted to uh, bring up a lecture about saying that white people are racist, like, period. You know, he didn't say, <laughs> he didn't say that we ignorant or not. He said, you know, based on what I've been taught, you know, I'm supposed to behave this way. And, uh, yeah, that, that white student, she was uh, pretty much uh, not comfortable at all, period. And that that was very interesting as far as like a uh, like a lecture at a school. I can't remember the name of the high school, but it's over in Norman, Oklahoma. So uh, yeah, if you wanted to check that out, that's that's where it was located. Uh, see if you can give your view on that. That's that's all I have. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Um. My little uh, chum in Louisiana, Princess, did you have commentary? Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes, good evening. I just wanted to briefly um, comment. um, um, I'm not sure if you uh, came in later on. In the um, call, um, I'm not sure whether or not in your clips that you put over or covered over um, uh, Michelle Obama's speech. Um, in light of what um, a, a caller had just recently spoken about, about feeding into the gender wars, I will try not to uh, fall prey to that. Um, as I make my statement, I would just have to say as for black females, I just would um, hope that moving forward that we start to really try and uh, get our minds away from the concept of, you know, or the word um, women or a woman in reference to us. I I believe that as black females, we do not, uh, in the system that we live in, we are unable to obtain uh, that position or that right. Um, We've never been able to fulfill fulfill that role of womanhood in the system that we live in. So whether subconsciously or, uh, you know, we, whether we think of it or not, um, by us uh, equating ourselves um, as um, women, uh, we are in fact um, uh, promoting uh, white women's interests, uh, whether it's directly or indirectly. And I think that plays out a lot um, whether, you know, when we um, deal with um, our relationships amongst black males um, because we are trying to uh, obtain uh, some type of um, uh, uh, some type of uh, ideal um, setting in which we, we are supposed to interact with one another when in fact the only reference points that we have as far as what it is to be uh, women is um, uh, or you know white females, and I think um, 
I, I just I was just say I was just very disappointed in hearing Michelle's speech because it just seemed like it was just uh, her just um, just just using emotion a lot of emotion. And I, I frankly just don't see how black females can fall for um, supporting um, white women coming out in, in the defense of them speaking on their behalf about issues that they've never spoken out uh, for us, whether it was during formal slavery or what we've been going through with, with their men, really. Um, the only thing that we're dealing with as far as us and black males is what they've created as far as the system. But, you know, if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't be having any issues in our household. But um, other than that, that's it. I'll meet mine. Thank you, guys. For sure. Uh Anyone else that we uh, missed that didn't get an opportunity to share at all? Anybody that we missed? Glorious. <laughs> Got everybody. Uh, anybody have any, any uh, comment they need to get in before we get ready to wrap things up? Yes, uh, yes. can I be heard? Uh, you can both get 60 seconds. Uh, retired firefighter, go first. Yes, I, w I would just like to commend the uh, the, the lady who uh, just spoke. I know how tough that is to to mention, and especially in front of a whole uh, mention in in the presence of non-white black people that we don't qualify under the system of racist white supremacy as men and women. We don't really qualify, and in my mind, for those who say that they are men and women, it must be some some sort of unsatisfactory uh, uh, identification that makes you qualify, uh, certainly under the global system of racist white supremacy and how it affects us ever since its uh, establishment. And so I just wanted to uh, commend her on, on that because I, I, even even when I – state that in conversation I, I feel uneasy from the standpoint that whoa I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to get a tremendous amount of pushback on this you know on this quote-unquote false pride that we have uh, on that subject that's all I wanted to say thank you mm -hmm. uh, was Roz the other person that was going to comment Yes, um, I just wanted to give the names of a couple of other <laughs> films that show counter-racist violence. One is called Ill-Gotten Games, another one is called Sankofa, and the third is called Quilombo. That one's about uh, revolts in Brazil. Uh, thank you, and I'll meet my line. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, yes, um, very quickly, I just wanted to say um, that I wanted to speak about Haiti and um, just remind people when they had the earthquake, um, they didn't have any bulldozers in the whole country they found out. So, I mean, you could imagine just how poor that country is. Um, and, and particularly, I wanted to hit on um, a lot of the pro-Trump white people um, who have um, radio shows and podcasts and things, they have um, really come up with a lot of good things. Well, I mean, I find it really credible um, evidence of foul play in Haiti from the Clinton Foundation, um, even though um, no one's paying attention to it. And um, um, I'm getting my line. Thank you. I don't want, I don't want. Um, the, I was making sure I didn't, uh, didn't miss anybody. Uh, can, can I be heard? Yes, sir. I, yes, I just wanted to uh, tag on uh, what the previous caller just said. Uh, just Google uh, Hillary Clinton, um, Haiti, gold mine. Just Google those three terms, and you will see some very interesting information. I'll mute my line. Thank you. For sure. Uh, I was just going to add quickly with regards to uh, Princess Princess's suggestion. Um, I can't say that I have a 
caught some flack uh, before. It was not anything that, you know, ruined my day or what have you, but just this has been something that has come up uh, in my writing and in talking verbally about racism, white supremacy, and I consistently refer to black males, black females. I use the term male, female, uh, where I've had people get upset about that uh, online or in things that I've written. And the thing that I noted was that I've never had anyone get upset about me using the term black male. Uh, every time where people have taken issue, it's been about the term black female and saying that somehow that that is sexist and patriarchal. And I've had males bring this up, females bring it up. Uh, I just deal uh, with that sort of uh, flack uh, for using those terms, even though I think they are completely valid, accurate, that we do not qualify for woman, man under the system of white supremacy. Uh, we will be here every day for the next week. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow, uh, a little more than 12 hours, the Global Sunday Talk on Racism. We certainly will devote more time to talking about what's happening in Haiti and elsewhere uh, worldwide, uh, getting some of our international uh, listeners' thoughts on the U.S. election as well. But that'll be tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Pacific. Uh, we'll be here on Monday. Mary Beth Gassman, she is a white woman. Uh, she wrote, uh, or now it's a series of articles. In fact, let me see if I can pull it up really quick. She wrote uh, an article that was explaining that whites are not ignorant and that they deliberately work to make sure that they do not have black faculty members, professors at historically uh, white institutions. And so this essay, this report, it was in the Washington Post maybe a month ago, it generated such a response that they did a follow-up report. And so they wrote the follow-up report and they shared some of the different comments that they got from people that said they got over 6,000 uh, emails and what have you uh, in response to this one essay that this white woman, our guest Monday, wrote. One of the responses was from a black female. She wrote in, she said, Despite having terrific credentials and applying for over 200 faculty positions, I have been denied for a faculty position over and over, making me wonder if pursuing a Ph.D. was worth it. I wonder if I should discourage other African-Americans from doing so. That was just one of the responses to this report. But uh, Mary Beth Gassman, she'll be with us this coming Monday, Tuesday, the white author of Blood at the Root, which deals with the racial cleansings in Forsyth County, Georgia. Uh, he'll be with us Monday evening. Really looking forward to uh, discussing this program, back-to-back -back white people on the program. Wednesday, Allison Manswell. She's a black female. She wrote a whole book about workplace racism. It's called Listen In. She'll be with us Wednesday. So workplace racism issues, bring them Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we conclude the spook who sat by the door. Uh, all the times uh, for the programs are normal, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, except the Sunday broadcast. Uh, next Saturday, we'll be here for the compensatory call-in. And then one week from tomorrow, October 23rd, Charles Woods will be here. I'm sure we'll get his thoughts on the new birth of a nation, as well as his views on racism in entertainment. Uh, with that, uh, we should be good for the day. Uh, Roz, what were the uh, first two films that you mentioned uh, that had counterviolence uh, in them. We got Columbo as the third. Yes, um, the first one was Ill Gotten Games. It has um, Shimon Hunsu in it and another um, black actress. Her name is Akasu, Akasu, uh, I forget her last name. But there, this, it's all about uh, counter, counter racist violence as well as infused with African spirituality. It's actually a very good movie. And the other one is called Sankofa by Haile Jarima. And that one also stars Muda Baruka. Grand. I saw that one. I saw that one. Um, yeah, that's right, awesome. Right on. Uh, viewing material. Oh, uh, well, it's a documentary, but uh, War of the Heads, Africa 1906, War of the Heads. One of our previous guests was on. I think that would definitely qualify as counterviolence kind of because uh, that's what black people were doing, going out to uh, kill racist race soldiers in South Africa. Um, with that, Thank you kindly for tuning in. I hope it was a constructive investment of your Saturday evening, and we will be here tomorrow afternoon, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. <clears throat> if you have questions, if you can't find something in the archives, if you're confused, uh, if you have guest suggestions, uh, just drop us an email, untiljustice at gmail.com, untiljustice at gmail.com. 
Uh, with that, thanks for tuning in. I will state again, sobriety would be best under conditions of war. You never know uh, when today will be the day that we bump into Daniel Holtzclaw, Darren Wilson, any of these other race soldiers, badge or no. Uh, we want to be able to make phenomenal decisions to keep ourselves as safe as possible under wartime conditions. Uh, I do not think being under the influence of alcohol, cannabis, cigarettes, anything else that they can list or think of, uh, none of that stuff thus far has shown that it is helping us to resolve the biggest problem we're facing in the known universe, racist man, racist woman, racist child. Uh, with that, thanks for tuning in. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim. Goodbye. Problem. You're a victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Ah.